Hello everyone. I'm glad to see you on my channel. The story I'm going to tell you today is pure. It is true that all the bad things that happen in life happen for a reason. It is said that we can appreciate the good things, the things when they happen to us. I hope you enjoy this story. I wish you a pleasant viewing experience. Diana looked out the window where other children were playing and envied them. Hide and seek, Cossack bandits, soccer, and dozens of other fun activities were all near and far at the same time. She never got to meet anyone in the yard, but that wasn't the only thing stopping her. She just doesn't have time for games or even for acquaintances. Diana had to grow up early. The family can't do without her. First, her mother was in an accident, was in the hospital for a long time, with difficulty moved to a wheelchair, and almost immediately, unable to withstand the grief, Grandma Betty went ill. She, of course, moved, but no further than the apartment. And now, at the age of 11, Diana became the legs and arms of the family. The girl hoped that soon everything would change. Daddy called her and promised he'd come back and help her. Even if he took on some of Diana's household chores, she would be able to go outside, not only to school, to the store, or to the post office. Diana sighed and began to prepare vegetables for borscht, following her grandmother's recipe. First peel potatoes, grate beets and carrots, fry them in a frying pan with tomatoes and onions. Then boil the broth, only be sure to pour out the first broth. Carefully put the fried vegetables in the pot, so that without splashing, otherwise the kitchen will have to clean. And then she added an author's touch to her grandmother's recipe. When the borscht was almost ready, she added mushrooms and sausages, and put a lid on it to let it stand, Grandma Betty told her, sprinkle vinegar on it. With borscht like this, any guy will marry you. You cook it today, and I'll show you how to make it tomorrow. I'll just rest a bit. Tomorrow never came. Grandma had many recipes, but now they could only afford the most inexpensive products. Pasta, rice and beans, buckwheat with minced meat or hot sandwiches, and both Grandma and Mom needed to eat well to keep from getting sick. Diana sighed again. She wanted a piece of real sausage or salted trout so badly. A month ago, when there had been a party at school and the benefactors from the administration had come, she couldn't keep her eyes off the tray of snacks. Some big guy in a jacket even reprimanded her. You shouldn't eat too many sandwiches, he said. You'll get a tummy ache. Silly, silly uncle. How can food give you a tummy ache? It's more likely that she'll get cramps from hunger again. From the big stage, the school children were told how much they care about orphans, homelessness, and other problems of people. And then, they gave her a ball and a stick. Diana would have gladly replaced the equipment with a couple of bags of potatoes, rice, and buckwheat. Lunch is ready, said the girl joyfully. Today she was lucky. There was a lot of meat left on the chicken bones, which the saleswoman proudly called the soup set. Diana carefully cut it off to divide it equally. Mom could make it to the kitchen, though it cost her a lot of effort. Grandma, on the other hand, would have to be fed in the bedroom. She only got out of bed to get to the toilet or bathroom. Oh, Diana, psych her mother, sitting in a wheelchair. You should go outside. Take a walk. I can't, answered the girl. I have to mop the floor, do the laundry, and now the dishes. Feed Grandma. Diana never showed her mother that it was hard for her. The girl felt guilt early on. She was the reason her mom was in a wheelchair, if she had not distracted her that day. True, her mother convinced her otherwise, but still. Now Diana tried to somehow make up for her guilt, and for this it was necessary to become everything for her mother and grandmother. Cooking, cleaning, going to the store. How hard could it be? We should go for sour cream, Mom said. I'm out. Good, sighed Diana. I'll just feed Grandma. Do you have any money left? Mom asked. The allowance won't be transferred until tomorrow. Maybe I have some change. There was only one store left in their part of town, and they didn't want to go there. The girls still remembered how they used to live close to the center of the metropolis. In such a place, where on a tiny piece of land try to settle as many people as possible. They lived on the 25th floor, and it wasn't at the top. Diana had been used to heights since childhood and had no idea how to get down to the ground. But she had to. A long time ago, when there was nothing to portend trouble, Diana had admired the views of the city from her window. And now they lived on the first, so there was at least a slim chance that her mother could go outside. 
In theory, it was easy. The first floor is optimal for a wheelchair user. It would seem that open the door, carefully lower the wheels and enjoy the open space. The picture was spoiled by the stairs between the entrance and the landing. Only seven steps, Diana sometimes overcame them in one jump. But for mom, it was a real Everest. The administration promised to solve the issue, to put a ramp or an elevator, someday. And then where to go? In the center near the house, there was a subway and stores. But here in the suburbs, even the curves are not lowered everywhere. A couple of times a month, they did go for a walk. If someone helped the mother herself to move the wheels. But that wasn't all Diana cared about. Looking at her mom, she realized she was giving up. She was finding it harder and harder to move forward, harder to heal and smile. She was getting desperate, which meant that the headmaster's warnings might well become real. Grandma, are you going to eat? The girl asked. Feeding Grandma Betty is a ritual. First, you have to help her sit down. Then you have to move the table to the bed. To hear from Baba Batty a whole treatise of words of advice, compliments, and life stories. Then she would take a spoon or fork in her hands, peck at the dish her granddaughter had prepared, and sink into her memories. Casey, when will you get married? Grandma Betty might ask in the middle of the meal. Diana sighed. That her grandmother confused her with her mother was half the problem. Such questions were clearly connected to something more serious. Even with her childish mind, she realized that Betty was going deeper and deeper into her own world, beginning to confuse not only people, but times. She felt sorry for her grandmother. Diana somehow could not remember her young. It felt like she had come into this world as an old woman. Baba Betty, is the borscht tasty? The girl asked to change the subject. Yes, nodded the old woman. Only you forgot the potatoes. How? Diana was surprised. Here it is, floating. Is that a potato? Grandma Betty lamented. Then followed a monologue about how in her youth she worked in the collective farm and spent time in the fields. Diana had heard this story hundreds of times, and from time to time the narrative grew with new details. Over the years, the heroism of rural workers increased, and the potatoes in her grandmother's stories became the size of watermelons. Diana took the dishes from her grandmother, carried them to the kitchen, and began to get ready for the store. Where is that bag? It seems to cost only a few rubles, but if you pay every time, you'll eventually run up a hundred. Run to the store already. I'll wash the dishes. Don't worry, Mom said, but the girl shook her head. Mom kept trying to do some housework, but Diana knew that every movement brings her pain, especially in the stroller. After the move, there was no money left for special furniture. The regular kitchen set didn't fit Mom in any way. If she could reach the sink, it was with great difficulty. Save your strength, Mom, Diana said. I'll wash the dishes and go to the store. The girl as much as she could delay the grocery shopping, and it was not just a lack of money. On her grandmother's pension and her mother's allowance, they could survive. The money was distributed by Mom, first of all for the most necessary things. At least they weren't in danger of starving. It was the saleswoman who seemed to have taken up residence in the pavilion. Her razor sharp words really hurt. You could walk to the supermarket, but first of all, it's a half hour walk. Secondly, that I'd have to carry the heavy bags home. And thirdly, the prices are too high. They could afford a store with a sharp tongued saleswoman. A supermarket, no. Do you want me to go to the store with you? Mom suggested it. She knew exactly what was embarrassing her daughter. No, no, the girl replied. What a win, you'll get cold feet again. You just don't listen to her, Mom said. Take the groceries, give her the money and that's it. Do you want me to file a complaint against her? There must be someone to take care of her. Mom, relax. It's okay. The screen on Diana's cell phone lit up. She looked at it and hurried to turn it over. You didn't notice? Mom didn't seem to see anything suspicious in her sudden movement. That's good, otherwise she would be angry. The girl had her own secrets, which she didn't want to tell her mother or grandmother about yet. Many years ago, Talented managers came up with a formula for success that allowed tiny stores to compete with huge supermarkets. To do this, there should have been no more than two people and the working day to grow to obscene values. This, however, should not have any effect on the salaries of employees. Only the most desperate people could endure such conditions. One of them is firmly attached to the store with the poetic name Dibney. 
look who's here, shouted the saleswoman. Our heroine, a Spartan girl. Well, do you want to choose the potatoes on offer? There was nothing marvelous in the store. Diane thought they should put another mean sign on the front. It was the clerk who was always humiliating her. One day, the two of them had come here alone with her mom, and the wheelchair user's affliction had become a source of inspiration for the mean woman. She did not miss the slightest opportunity to say another bar. Thank God, there was no one in the pavilion at that time. There was no escape from the sharp tongue of a woman of indeterminate age. She seemed to take pleasure in the fact that she could treat customers as she pleased. There was simply no second store in their neighborhood, a mystery. Diana put sour cream, tasteless cookies, and bread in the basket. She thought about it and added the cheapest glazed cheese. Oh, what's the holiday? The saleswoman splashed her hands in a martial arts way. Birthday, will you spread cheese on cookies? The girl was silent. Such jokes could still be tolerated, although she gave it with difficulty. But sometimes the saleswoman crossed the boundary of all decency and said really hurtful things, bringing Diana to tears. Why she wanted to do that is unclear. Could mom run away? The woman continued. The lack of response from Diana was getting on her nerves. The faker. I've seen her move her leg. She's playing the part for the benefit, isn't she? How much do I owe you? Diane asked, putting her purchases on the counter. I'm not telling you, said the clerk. Not until you answer my questions. The door slammed. Another customer entered the pavilion. And since Juliana didn't know him, she preferred to keep quiet. She practiced her barbs and witticisms only with regular customers. The newcomer seemed to have been here a couple of times, bought bread and cigarettes. But he didn't look familiar enough to be her victim. And he looked too serious for that. All right, said the clerk. 290 rubles. And no change. But there was nothing in her purse but change anyway. So she counted out the sum without difficulty. Quickly putting the purchases in a bag, the girl hurried out the door. Uh, that's it, she wouldn't go here again for anything. And now home. After all, in addition to her chores, she still had homework to do. And school wasn't going so well. The store's right next door, just a five-minute walk. Just in time to call her dad, he sent her a smiley face on Messenger. So that mom did not find out about their communication. She signed it as her classmate, Leslie, and in the correspondence, only funny pictures and funny videos. It's like two girls exchanging humor. The precaution was unnecessary because her mom didn't touch her smartphone or control it in any way anyway. Hi, Diana said. How are you? I'm fine, Dad answered. His voice was tired, as always. It's been a whole year since they started communicating. Dad was far away now, somewhere in Africa, but he would surely come back. Diana believed that for some reason. Every conversation ended with his promises that he was going home, but for some reason he never gave any exact dates. I have good news, Dad said. I think two more weeks and that's it. And home. To us. Diana asked hopefully. Dad didn't say anything. Then he told her about his work. He described with enthusiasm how many different buildings they were building in a foreign distant land. He told her how interesting his work was and how strange the rules were in the African country that he sends money, but his mother refuses to receive it, and she wouldn't answer her phone. Diana believed it. What else could she do? Don't tell mom I called, dad told her goodbye, or she'll get angry again. Okay, Diana replied. I'll be back, and then everything will be fine. I will, just hang in there. No one knew they were calling each other. Her mom had strictly forbidden her to talk to her father since she was a little girl. Diana cried at first but then she got used to it. Both her grandmother and mother said only bad things about him. Up to a time, the girl believed it all. But the situation changed after the very accident when her blossoming and successful mother was in a wheelchair. Mom, I'm back, Diana announced. Good for you. Are you okay or is something wrong? Casey always noticed her daughter's mood swings. Now she came in here, not herself. She must have been listening to that sales drill again. Casey wondered why a woman in a tiny store would talk to customers like that. But here, on the outskirts of the city, where they were forced to move from the center of their own rules. Well, Mom, Diane replied. All in all, it's fine. Let's talk about it, Casey suggested. 
The hardest thing about being a disabled person is the isolation. Not being able to go to work, not being able to pick out your own clothes at the store, not even being able to go to church. And you can't mop the floor or get anything off the top shelf of the closet. You need a helper all the time. Your daughter, the youngest and only one, became your helper. And then mom got sick, as if she didn't have enough to deal with. Casey felt remorse all the time. She was ashamed of her own helplessness, of the pain that accompanied every movement. It had been three years since her accident, and there was little hope of recovery. Yes, mom, Diana said, there's something I wanted to talk to you about. I don't know how you'll feel about it. Suddenly, they heard some noise coming from Grandma's room. Betty watched television almost all day long, but now was the rare moment when the box was silent. That's why the rumble seemed especially loud. Diana froze in a daze. Clinging to the wall, Casey moved slowly toward her mother's room. She traversed the hallway and pushed open the door. Diana, the woman shouted, hurry up and get in here. Grandma's not well. Diana, where's my phone? It's a strange thing about the human memory. Only the fondest memories remain in it, especially school. Over time, the twos, the remarks, the antics of classmates fade. The inedible dishes of the school cafeteria. In any warm moments, any celebrations become brighter. Daisy was stuck in this school, which she'd been in charge of for a good two decades. And she still didn't want to retire. Hello, once again, the principal was being nice. Come in, have a seat. Tea or coffee? We don't have time for that, replied the interlocutor gloomily. Strong coffee, but no sugar. The inspectors had been to her school countless times. Before Daisy's eyes, approaches to education were changing. From the absolute freedom of the noughties to the total control of the twenties. She'd seen the piercing epidemic, survived the invasion of rappers in oversized pants, witnessed the birth and untimely death of Emo, and only one thing remained constant, the constant complaints of the administration. Daisy was nervous. There were too many issues with this Diana and her family. In her quiet school, where only children of ordinary parents attended, hardship was neither liked nor approved of. A third letter had come down from the administration, demanding that they look into the situation and take action. Daisy was hinted that her unwillingness to read between the lines could be seen as incompetence. The child is in a dangerous situation, argued John, a department head in the administration. We could lose the girl at any moment. Don't you agree with me? The principal's intransigence forced the official to come to her school in person. Daisy wistfully recalled the two blissful years of the coronavirus pandemic. Remote working, off days, but paid, masks for visitors. And most importantly, no inspections. Alas, the sweet time is over. And now, if an official suddenly wants to visit her, he may not even warn. I can't imagine how a teacher with such a solid experience in work experience doesn't see the problem. The official lamented, it is obvious that the girl needs our help. We work with her every day, the principal assured him. Here, take a look. Inspections, testing, preventive talks. All according to the manual. More coffee? This coffee only makes my heart ache, John replied with ostentatious sadness. Do it again with a little more sugar. And let's not change the subject, please. Daisy took a deep breath. She looked at the official and tried to calculate his age. He graduated from Teachers University at 22 at the earliest, three years at least he'd spent as a school teacher. Then he probably worked his way up to deputy. That's another three years. Then he spent a long time trying to get through the selection process for a higher position. Total. 33 years old, not younger than she's old enough to be her son. She certainly looks older than she is. You have outdated information, the official said. I can state with all certainty that the grandmother is not able to look after the child. Why? The principal was surprised. Age is not a judgment, young man. What's that got to do with it? The official waved his hand resentfully. It's something else. She went to the hospital yesterday with a fractured femoral neck. We have, you know, the latest information. What a nightmare, Daisy whispered. Such a fracture is every elderly person's worst dream. You see, John nodded his head. We have to take immediate action. You can't just write it off as some mythical grandmother's care. As you can see, I'm well informed. Daisy sighed again. 
she would have to call a council and invite both the girl and her mother. She was notoriously difficult to get around. She'd have to bring the matter before the council, hear their opinions. For some reason, Daisy didn't want to make a mess of it. People lived their lives. Why bother them? You'd think there weren't any other problem families on her property. One question, she said. Why do you care so much about this family? Is she special? Two months and the end of the year, before you know it, and you have not removed the single child at risk from the family, answered the official from the administration. A zero, a bare zero in the column. You myopically fail to notice that it's the stones who are fit to add a one to the report. Or how do we explain that gap at the end of the year? So we just don't have those kids, Daisy replied calmly. It's an old neighborhood. Families are few. We've never suffered from a glut of dysfunctional ones. I don't want to hear excuses, the man shouted. Every neighborhood is the same. You're the only one with a zero. Enough, we have to act. John spoke about a thousand words and drank four cups of coffee. Daisy started out as a math teacher and automatically counted everything that happened around her. That made her feel better. She felt sorry for Diana in both a motherly and human way. The entire faculty was aware of her troubled history. Now the absence of her grandmother was added to the ordeal. The principal sighed and pressed the selector button. Elizabeth, she said, prepare the order. We'll be holding a rash Julian council on the stones. What is today, Tuesday? Let's make it Friday, 6 o'clock p.m. Diane looked around fearfully. Hospitals always scared her. They were like whole towns with their own enclosed areas. While you figure out where to go, while you look at the map, it was scary, but there was nowhere to go. Grandma was waiting. Diana could hardly find the right building. It was the biggest and the tallest. Not a hospital, but a whole metropolis. Now the last obstacle left on the way was a nurse who had to follow instructions. No, children are not allowed either, said the woman in the white coat. I understand that you want to see your grandmother. I can hand you the phone and you can make a video call. But she doesn't know how to use it. Diana almost screamed. From resentment and helplessness, she wanted to weep. The girl had traveled a long way, all alone, to hear such a thing. Diana could not understand why she, her own granddaughter, would not be allowed to visit her grandmother. That's when her mother was in the hospital. The doctors even insisted that she came more often. But now? Okay, the nurse gave up. I'll show you in. But just for a minute. Put on shoe covers and a mask, too. You have your own, don't you? Diana started to cry out of resentment. How did she know she had to bring a mask and shoe covers to the hospital? All she had taken were large sandwiches, just the way her grandmother liked them, and also a bag carefully folded by her mother, slippers, a mug, a towel, and other small things. In the world of adults' too many conventions, the girl could not get used to them. Okay, sighed the nurse. Here, put it on, but do not cry. Let's go. I hope no one will see us, and I won't get punished for this. The woman led Diana through the long, long corridors of the first floor. It was the second time the girl had been in such a large hospital, but she was still amazed at the scale. Three years ago, when the accident happened to her mom, Diana was taken to the ward by her grandmother. Now she has to wander the corridors on her own, without an adult. You understand, it's not my whim, the nurse excused herself. It's the pandemic, the coronavirus. Do you know what it is? Yes, answered Diana. Of course you do. The girl loved learning through Zoom. She could devote many times more time to her mother and grandmother. And then when studying went back to the usual format, the opportunities disappeared. And now she had to get up at the crack of dawn to make breakfast, throw out the trash, and help her mom get dressed. Here we go, the nurse answered as she led her to the service elevator. Come on in, baby. We're getting slaughtered for this coronavirus. You're lucky you're right next to the elevators. The rounds are over. No one will see us. Just make it quick, okay? Grandma was lying on the bed with her leg hanging from the ceiling. It was weird, but it was warm, and there were only three people in the room. Grandma Beatty turned to her granddaughter, as if she could sense her, and a smile immediately appeared on the old woman's gray face. What she had been through. Oh, Casey, she said. Can you believe it? I twisted my ankle. Grandma, it's me, Diana, said the girl. I brought sandwiches. The nurse let them talk for a few minutes and went to check on the other patients. 
she would adjust someone's pillow, give someone a bottle of water. Diana thought how hard this job was. She didn't want to work in a hospital. She had a completely different dream. Grandma, does it hurt a lot? The girl asked. Well, the old woman waved her hand. It'll heal. When I saw you, I thought of Casey again. How is she? As Diana walked toward the subway, she felt very tired. She had homework to do and then a massage for her mom. If she didn't exercise her legs, they wouldn't work. Suddenly her cell phone rang and a familiar number popped up. Diane, don't worry, that's what the class said. Daisy's having some big board meeting Friday night. You should bring your mom. But you know that, sighed the girl. She is already tired of telling everyone that the wheelchair is not an all-terrain vehicle and therefore to climb to the second floor of her mother will not be able to. Diana, don't worry, the teacher continued. Daisy knows. We'll be meeting on the first floor. I told our men to help. Mom's gonna be there for sure. I'll call her too, okay? It's hard to live without a dream, and Diana had one too. When the girl got off the subway, she suddenly froze in front of a billboard. There were three ballerinas on it, frozen in the most graceful movement imaginable. For a few minutes, Diana stood admiring them, unable to move from her seat. She wanted to be a ballerina too. She had all the data for it. Long legs, slender body, excellent stretching. But when would she go to class? The school advertised various clubs and sections. They'd also called her to ballet, but warned her that the selection was very strict. Of course, Diana would have passed it. But where would her family find the money to buy her special shoes and a skirt? Who would drive her to the other side of town? Apparently, the dream would remain a dream. All Diana could do was put her feet up and stretch in her room, imagining she was studying ballet and admiring ballerinas on her phone. The drive to and from the hospital took over three hours. It was nine o'clock at night and there was still so much to do. Casey tried not to show her desperation to anyone. At some point, she'd pulled the black card and her life had gone downhill ever since. Trouble started with Steve swearing his undying love for so many years and then running away. Then the accident. She still couldn't believe that such a ridiculous accident could wipe out all of her plans and hopes for the future. Now her mom was in trouble and she couldn't do anything to help. Casey felt like a doll with something broken. She couldn't feel her legs at all, despite such a long treatment. But problems, as it turns out, weren't enough. So today, the call from school came. Instead of helping her, of caring for her, they want to take her child away from her. Is that fair? The front door slammed. You can hear it on the first floor. The key in the lock turned. Her daughter is back. Finally. How is she? Casey asked when Diana appeared in the doorway. Lying down, the girl shrugged. Did you talk to her? Did they let you in? Yes, Diana answered. Only it's a secret. Don't tell anyone. The woman laughed. Diana was the only joy in Casey's life. Looking at her, she realized that everything was not in vain, but now she was the only support too. Who would try to keep them apart is beyond me. I got a call from the school, Casey said. They said they can't live without me. They're expecting me over Friday night. I mean, you know, it's like the weekend's starting and I gotta get home and they're trying to get me out. I know, Diane said. Are you gonna eat your pancakes? I'll make them real quick. Casey watched her daughter kneading the batter and couldn't get enough of it. Yeah, the kid had to grow up fast. On the other hand, she's so independent. She can cook clean, do her own laundry. If they had a little more money, it would be possible to order ready-made food right at home. It was good that the girl understood all the trials that fell to her lot. Did you do your homework? Casey asked. Do you want me to help you? No, mommy, you don't have to, Diana answered. I can do it all by myself. This independence on the one hand pleased, but on the other, frightened. It wouldn't be long before she'd be out of the house, and she has to think about how to prepare for that time. Not long ago, she was a strong and independent woman. She worked as a deputy director of construction, personally traveled to the sites and controlled everyone and everything. And now she can't even control her own limbs. Mom, they're not going to take me away, are they? Diana asked suddenly. What do you mean? Casey was surprised. Who will? Those people at school, the class teacher told me you can't do parenting, like. Don't worry, sunshine, replied Casey. You gotta fight till the end. You can't give up. 
Put the pancakes over here and I'll wrap carrots in them. The insidiousness of her injury was that any careless movement could cause unbearable pain. Now she had raised her arms too high, and a pulse pierced her entire body. Even her legs hurt, though she couldn't feel them at all. Casey instantly turned pale and sweat appeared on her forehead. Mom, come on, Diana said. I'll wrap it myself. Okay. Casey agreed. Hand me my pills. If it weren't for the painkillers, she'd have lost her mind a long time ago. Casey swallowed one pancake with difficulty, then turned around and went to her room. When she bought this apartment, she thought she'd been lucky. Three rooms, first floor, not the worst neighborhood. But now, after a year of living on the outskirts, the dead end was more and more clearly visible. The money was spent on treatment, not even enough for a decent stroller. Mommy, I need to massage my legs, Diana said. Don't sigh, Casey. Why don't you get some rest? Mom, you're not giving up, are you? Seriously, asked her daughter. Of course I'm not. Okay, go ahead. She'd never asked Diana to help, but the smart girl had watched carefully the expensive resuscitator who had come a few times a year ago and had memorized his movements. He needed her legs as she lay on the bed, rubbing her muscles. It wasn't easy for the girl, of course, but Diana tried. Now she was visited only by a free doctor, and from him she heard only regrets but she was grateful for that too. 11 p.m. Was another shift coming to an end? Julian walked to the entrance to flip the sign to see the host and lock the lock. Suddenly, someone yanked the door open sharply, so sharply that she couldn't hold it. Night visitors, come to think of it. No, darling, you'll have to find somewhere else to entertain yourself. It's closed, she said in the nastiest voice she could muster. No, my princess, replied the tipsy man. One more minute. We have to work to the last customer. Get out. The princess is not in the mood today, Julian replied, shoved the uninvited guest and quickly closed the door. She felt better immediately. Doing bad things to people was wonderful. It was only at times like this that she forgot for a second how worthless and miserable her life was. But there was no one to blame. She had backed herself into a corner. Julian loved trading, but there was nothing else she could do. Since she was 16, she had stood behind various counters, selling beer and glass, gloves and eyeglasses, moving further and further up the sales career ladder. But in this stall, probably called a pavilion, she was stuck. Why didn't you serve her? A fat man behind her counter asked her reproachfully. She hadn't even noticed he'd come in, quiet as always, just before closing time. How does he manage to do this every time? I'm closed, Julian answered but in a less confident tone. 11 o'clock at night is closed. I'll give you that closed. Go get him. Come on, Jacob demanded. The sales drill had no choice but to rush to the entrance, open it, and go outside. Outside. Illuminated by the streetlights, Julian easily recognized the wobbly figure of the guest. It was not that he had gone far away. Come back, she shouted. The princess changed her mind. She called the man for a long time. He moved slowly, wobbling, but did not even turn around. He only waved his hand, saying, Leave me alone. Maybe he was afraid she'd beckon him to close the door. Yeah, she's in for a world of hurt. So this is how we pay our debts? Jacob yelled at her when she came back alone. I forgive you for everything, by the way. And you? I'm sorry, Jacob. I'm sorry, Julian said and smiled. She wished he hadn't hit her this time. The old bruises on her face had just healed, and she didn't want to get new ones in their place. Look at me, said the owner and went deep into the receipts. He came every three days for the proceeds, trusting no one else to handle the money. I'll forgive it this time, all right. Julian tried to remember where this life had started. Paul, as they say, her common-law husband had gotten her a job in this pavilion. He himself worked as a loader, and she got a place behind the counter. Ira was naive and stupid at the time, she didn't do accounting at all. And Jacob was different, courteous, caring, polite. She liked everything, the two-by-two -two schedule, the salary, and the atmosphere. But Paul disappeared one day, after a year of working together, and that's when she learned the dreaded word inventory. Jacob discovered a huge shortage of half a million rubles. Julian couldn't even believe that such a large sum could be stolen from such a store. 
but the owner was convinced that Julian and her boyfriend had been stealing his money, and they pinned it on her. Jacob spoke arrogantly. Thank Paul. Thank your failed husband. The owner fired the second shift, leaving Julian alone in the company of a disenfranchised loader. That didn't stay long and changed shifts almost every month. The saleswoman now kept a close eye on the money from the cash register. She wrote it all down and checked the receipts, but her debt was melting too slowly. In two years, Jacob had only written off half the money. She had to work 12 hours at the counter to pay off her debts. Only one day off, Sunday, kept her warm. Then she could come to work not at 9 in the morning, but at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Kind of like a day off. Have you forgotten where I got you? Jacob asked. Forget my kindness? I could have turned you into the police, you and Paul. Jacob, come on, Julian said. It's been so long. You're going to work me and work me and work me. Did you see Paul sneaking money out of the cash register? I did and I didn't say a word. So you were in on it with him. I haven't forgotten anything. Julian sighed. It was a shame not only to get such a large debt, but also to lose her admirer overnight. He quietly packed up their room and retreated. At least he called her. She changed since then too. All I had to do was piss off the customers. The only people who come here are those who have nowhere else to go. One time I yelled at an old lady who couldn't find a penny and it was over. So that Casey could attend the meeting, the principal decided to hold it in the auditorium. This was the only place where a person in a wheelchair could get in without any problems. Looking at the girl's mother, Daisy felt both pity and fear. If it were up to her, she wouldn't have looked at the half-paralyzed woman at all. She had to get this done quickly and move on. Dear colleagues, Daisy said, let's not waste any time. Let's get on with the Stone situation. This is the third time we've been instructed to check the family's condition and make a conclusion as to whether Casey Stone is capable of being a parent for the third time. Casey felt disgusted. School was only a five-minute walk from home, but they seemed to her like a march to Calvary. First, Two locals took her down the stairs in a wheelchair for $1,000. They almost dropped her. Then she was forced up hills and slowed down on descents to get to school. Diana kept trying to help, but she couldn't. A little girl can't handle a big stroller. We're getting alarming signals, the principal continued. In fact, Diana Stone has been left to fend for herself. She has to support not only herself, but also, pardon me for being blunt, her infirm mother. While we all deplore Casey Stone's situation, we need to, don't be rude, put the children first, is the psychologist here. The room they were invited into with their daughter was indeed crowded. Some pedagogue could well cope behind the rows of soft seats. Diana, tired after the school day and the transitions with her mother, almost dozed off in her seat. At first Casey wanted to get up and resent her. Then she remembered that she was confined to a wheelchair and decided to keep quiet. The child's emotional state is alarming, said the girl, obviously a psychologist. I conducted a series of tests for anxiety, depression, goal setting. What are the conclusions? Suddenly asked a full man in a jacket who was sitting on one of the armchairs. The psychological state is extremely unstable, the psychologist replied. The child is obviously under a lot of stress, which is understandable due to the situation in the family. There is a complete mismatch of age and behavioral roles. The psychologist said a lot of other clever things, the general sense of which was that Casey had put too much responsibility on her only daughter and herself, therefore, enjoying the situation. It was outrageous, but Casey knew how to keep her emotions in check, especially in a situation like this, where she had to be patient. Then the class teacher, who had not been particularly fond of Diana from the beginning, spoke. Then the representative of the parents' committee made a denunciatory speech, which surprised Casey. She kept silent, though it was getting harder and harder to hold back. Finally, the word came to Diana. What's going on? The girl asked, Why are you guys talking about us like this? Mom and Grandma and I are doing just fine. You better help. Diana interrupted the principal. We don't think your mom's capable of parenting. But Daisy, the girl objected. She's getting better. She's doing much better. Mommy works out every day. It's hard without grandma, but we're not going to give up. Why are we listening to her? Slammed his fist on the table full of a man who until now had remained silent, 
as we decide so it will be. There was a murmur in the hall, the teachers argued. Obviously, they had to solve such cases not often. It's one thing when parents abuse alcohol and children are not engaged. It's quite another if the mother is just in trouble and she's reacting so calmly to what's going on. Can I say something? Casey finally asked. Do I get a defense or not? Yes, please, nodded Daisy. We are listening attentively. I'm going through a difficult time, said Casey. You can't prepare for something like this. There are so many problems. But I can tell you one thing. I'm not giving up hope. I'm not giving up. I have a plan to fix everything. Stone, the man in the jacket interrupted her. You tell us one thing. Are you on those meds right now? Don't make me say that word out loud in front of the kids. No, said Casey. It was getting harder and harder to stay calm. The very drug that you don't want to say it has been out of stock in pharmacies for six months. I've decided to give it up myself. The man was embarrassed. He was quickly going through the papers on the table in front of him. He rubbed his head with both hands and looked from Daisy to Casey. He opened his mouth to say something, but then he faltered. I'm asking one thing, Casey said, to build on the success. Give us some time. I'll get a nurse. I'll get Diane assistant. I'll knock on every door to get us help. Who's gonna respect me? Julian replied sharply. Butter to give her through. I've been standing here for 12 hours at a time. I don't even have time to go to the bathroom. Because of the saleswoman's behavior, the line in front of the counter began to accumulate. The small pavilion could hardly fit 10 people. In the evening, there were a lot of visitors, and there might even be a queue. For some reason, Casey wanted to demonstrate her legal awareness. After all, people with disabilities should be served without waiting in line. Why not demand that the slut obey the law? Dear me, she said, I have the right not to stand in line. You must serve me on a priority basis. Come over here and sell me some butter. Only not to stand in line? Julian looked surprised. I wondered why you were always sitting. If you don't want to stand in line, don't stand in line. It seems to me that if you wanted to, you couldn't. The few customers looked at Casey. She couldn't take it anymore and cried. The saleswoman had hit a sore spot. The woman would never really be able to get up from her chair. No matter how much she wanted to convince herself otherwise, she could hire the best doctors, buy the most expensive medications, it wouldn't help. Her daughter approached the counter and looked at the saleswoman to family. You know what? You're actually the one who's never going to be able to get up. Me? Julian acted surprised. Look, I'm standing. And she took a few steps forward and backward to dispel any doubts. You think you're standing. You're not really standing. You're lying down. At the bottom. At the bottom? Julian asked. The girl who never responded to her barbs as if she were cutting her without a knife. You've given up, Diana said. That's why you're acting like this, and you can't give up. Never. Me? Julian flared up. Gave up? What do you know about it, you little thing? Yes, the girl nodded. I can see you don't like working here. I can see you're like a fly behind a pane of glass, fighting and fighting. My mom's strong. You're not even close. Choke on your butter, we're leaving. The girl turned around, grabbed Casey's strawler by the handles and started pushing it toward the exit. There were claps at her back as the sparse customers applauded. They must not have liked Julian and her jokes either. The saleswoman herself froze with her hand extended toward the refrigerator. The girl's words, harmless at first glance, had hurt her deeply and deeply. Why are we clapping? She said after a pause. I have no flies here, not a single one. Only bees fly to honey, you know. The seven steps leading to the first floor were her Everest. How do you climb them if your legs won't obey you? Because they were late for a meeting in the store, there were no one willing to help her climb them for a reasonable fee. After the humiliation of the last hour, Casey wanted to show her strength of character. Can you lift the chair? She asked her daughter. Bring it into the apartment. Yes, but... Casey didn't listen to the girl, grabbed the handrail at the wall and started climbing up. It was clumsy, but what can you do? You had to get used to it sometime. There was a flaw in her plan. Once on the platform, she was completely exhausted, and now she had to get back into the chair. Diana couldn't lift her crippled body. She'd already struggled to get the stroller in. We're out of oil, Casey said, lying on the platform with her head up. She smiled. Mommy, why did we move here? The girl asked. It's not a good place for a handicapped person. 
That's right. Casey agreed. We moved here because mommy ran out of money. Give me a hand. I'm gonna store my wheelchair. With great difficulty and with her daughter's help, she managed to climb back into the wheelchair. She was sweating from the exertion. Casey had expected her body to respond with pain to such an ordeal. But today her body was responding calmly to all the challenges and hardships. The reason for their move was trivial. When she sold her previous apartment and settled her debts with the bank, there wasn't much money left, and the first floor seemed like a great option to her. It's just, the man in the jacket started to say, but the principal interrupted him. Two weeks, Daisy said, two weeks to correct the deficiencies. Otherwise, the removal of the child is inevitable. All those in favor. The teachers raised their hands almost unanimously. Unanimously, said the principal. The board decided to recognize the family as a dangerous situation, to give a period of two weeks to eliminate the shortcomings that have been pointed out. So we're not holding the stones any longer. Help Casey up, out into the hall. On to other matters, colleagues. Mom, don't cry, Diana asked as they stood in the hallway. Don't cry. Come on. You and I have a lot to do. We need to stretch your legs. Wait, Casey replied, wiping away her tears. Wait a couple more minutes. I haven't said everything I need to say yet. Just then the door to the school hall opened and the principal came out. She walked quickly, not looking back, but it was impossible to keep up with the wheelchair-bound girl in the narrow hallway. Casey moved nimbly toward her, working her arms vigorously. She must have never been so fast in a wheelchair before. Daisy saw her and tried to change her trajectory, but it was too late. A word... Asked Casey, the principal tried to walk, but the woman nimbly grabbed her arm. How can you say no to a wheelchair user? Just a few words. Okay. Daisy gave in after a brief maneuvering. I'm listening. What kind of show is this? The woman was outraged. I'm going to complain. I'll go all the way to the top. You will all be fired. Do you hear me? Surprisingly, the director reacted calmly to the threats. She adjusted her jacket looked at Casey expressively. Listen to me, please, Daisy said. A child should have a childhood. It's not just about her becoming your nurse. It's about you too. You know what this is about, don't you? It was slow going in the other direction. Casey's arms were tired from the experience and her palms were blistered. She'd noticed that experienced strollers wore gloves, but for some reason she hadn't. She just hadn't quite gotten used to the idea that infirmity was permanent and you'd have to live with it. The girl just felt devastated. Teachers so mundanely decided her fate, as if it was a car or another inanimate object. Look, we're out of oil, Casey said. It might be a good idea to go to the store. It's on the way. No need, Mom, said Diane. There's that evil woman. She'll make fun of you again. No, let's go, Mom demanded. Let her say all the mean things to my face. If she has the guts. To get to the store, you had to cross the road and the curb. In front of the pavilion, there was a special lowering of the sidewalk, but exactly on this place, someone had put a huge car that could not go around or around. Diana came closer and looked for a plate with a phone number. Under the windshield was an ironic inscription. Is my car in the way? Sorry. Mom, let's go around, Diane said. No, said Casey. We could turn around and get in. Let's try it. The woman must have just lacked the experience of a stroller. For several minutes, she tried to climb the curb, but in vain. Eventually, she moved further down the path and found a low curb that wasn't blocked by a car. These movements had exhausted her and she literally couldn't feel her arms. She needed a break. There was a convenient ramp leading to the store, which Casey overcame with the help of her daughter. Together they were able to get through the transparent door. Inside there were several customers, old men and old women leisurely comparing prices and looking for the cheapest. No way. Julian splashed her hands picturesquely when she saw Diana and her mom in a wheelchair. They're my regulars. It's been a long time since your feet have been here, Queen Mother. Casey thought her daughter's stories about this woman were exaggerations. Now she could see for herself that they were real. The saleswoman kept going, as if in a hurry to tell all the crude jokes she'd made about wheelchair users. Casey was literally dumbfounded by this stream of bars. 
I thought that after our first meeting your feet would not be here anymore, continued the saleswoman, smiling wryly. Oh, I'm sorry. There are legs, but they're kind of gone. The crude jokes, which she could have just ignored, suddenly echoed in Casey's soul with pain. She wanted to answer so that the saleswoman would shut up, to say everything she thought about the insolent brat, who had no one else to take it out on. But I had no strength at all. Even a small line of customers couldn't stop the flow of snide remarks. It was as if Juliana had a second wind. She was both punching out the goods and humiliating her customer at the same time. Dear, Casey said instead in the calmest voice she could muster, you can see that this is a person with a disability. I need a package of butter. Show some respect. Mom, what did you say about a nurse? The girl suddenly asked, opening the door. Where are we going to get the money for her? That was just a figure of speech, Casey said. I bargained for two weeks. I'll figure something out. Your mom used to have a way with people, you know. The girl sighed. She seemed to be taking the situation more seriously than her mother. It was only now beginning to dawn on Diana that they might be separated. Who would take care of her mother? Who will stretch her legs, cook breakfast and dinner? The girl became very sorry for herself and her mother. But you cannot give up. You need to think. She just taught the sales clerk, who is three times her age, not to despair. Let's ask Dad for help, Diana suggested. I wish he was with us. Or get a room somewhere nearby. You don't have a father. Casey was angry, and her cheerful mood faded. He left you. He left you. Don't you dare say his name in my house. But Mom, they won't give up, the girl continued. They won't give up. Casey thought her daughter needed some kind word of encouragement. To encourage, to help to participate. But the words just wouldn't make sense in her head. How could she explain that her worthless father wouldn't help her? Not even by crawling to him on her knees. That's exactly what Casey could theoretically do for her daughter. Tomorrow's the weekend, mom said. We'll sit down together and figure out a way out of this. And we have to go to grandma's house. Can you make it? Of course, said the girl. Go take a break. I'll make sandwiches. I have some inspiration. Of course, the woman was lying. Her arms were very tired after the physical exertion. But she wanted to show herself that she could still do something. That she was a mother, not a burden. With the board on her lap, Casey could cook something. Like slicing bread and spreading butter on it. There was only a little bit of it left. It took a lot of effort to stretch it over four slices of bread. There was no meat either. So Casey finally chopped up two sausages she could reach in the refrigerator. At times the pain receded, and Casey could even hope for the best. And on this night, when her main body wasn't giving her any trouble, it was her soul that decided to suffer. Who was she kidding? She couldn't hire a nurse for herself or a babysitter for her daughter. It's not even that Diana was brilliant at all the housework. The problem is something else. Poverty is her biggest ailment. As soon as you fall out of the world of successful people, poverty is there. If you're young and healthy, it can be cured but not for the infirm and elderly. Casey thought about the fact that winter was coming and she didn't have the money to buy her daughter a new jacket and boots. Maybe she really should give up. They say everyone should help the infirm. On paper, maybe that's true, but in life it's the other way around. Agree with that solace principle and ask her for help. Maybe there's some boarding school where children can stay with infirm parents. Diana, called Casey, chasing away of her bleak thoughts. Come and have some tea. Diana hated the subway. Every time she went down to the subway, the girl felt an incomprehensible fear. Before the accident, her mother used to take her by car. She is an excellent driver. Together they would go to the swimming pool or to the supermarket, where you don't have to talk to the salespeople at all. Sometimes grandma joined them. The three of them had a lot of fun. Once again, the girl remembered that fateful day. However, mom sat her on the booster, buckled her in, press the gas. According to the rules, children are forbidden to travel in the front seat. But she and mom were so inseparable that they ignored that requirement. Mom had a big French car. Diane's fondest memories were of that car. How they went to New York for the weekend and wandered the beautiful streets, admired the waterfront. How they went to the ice arena and watched hockey. And then wandered around the floors of the parking lot for a long time because they forgot where they left their car. How together they went to the water park, where they rode down the high, high slice together on a cotton candy, 
Now all this is in the past. To Diana's daily routine was added a trip to the hospital. But just to say a trip. First, boil her grandmother's favorite borscht and pour it into a jar. Then to take the third trolley bus to the subway. Then another 20 minutes of shaking deep above the ground. And then finally, the hospital. But no one is allowed inside because of the quarantine. In the train car, Diana dozed off and saw that very day again. The crossroads that took Masha and her mother's health. The girl knew that the car had an automatic box. That means you only have to push the pedal and you don't have to pull the lever. Why did she tell her mom it was okay to drive? The girl got out of the subway and walked towards the hospital. She remembered well where the building she needed was. She tried to give herself a cheerful and carefree look. At the bottom, Diana met the same kind-hearted nurse who took her to her grandmother's room, despite the prohibitions. How do you do? Smiled the girl. I'm here to see Betty Stone. Do you remember me? I wish I could go up and talk to her. Mommy, and I miss her terribly. You can't, said the nurse, checking the list and sighing. No way. Can I pass the soup? Diana asked and picked up her bag. She was ready to say no, but she was still upset. No, darling, it won't work, said the woman in the white coat. Here, you know, there is such a thing. What's wrong? Your grandmother got worse, said the woman. Tonight, she was transferred to the intensive care unit. But don't worry and don't worry. It has nothing to do with the trauma. What does it have to do with? Diana asked. She felt the floor move out from under her feet. And then the nurse took her by the shoulder. Coronavirus be damned, she sighed. She tested positive. Her sats are low. You know what it does to old people? You're not mistaken. Diana asked hopefully. Maybe you're confusing my grandmother with someone else? If only, replied the nurse. Do you know how good my memory is? And her name is such a rare name, Betty. That was my grandmother's name too. But you hang in there. God willing, she'll pull through. What am I gonna do? The woman in the white coat took a piece of paper and scribbled some numbers on it. Here, it's the duty post in the red zone. You can call periodically and inquire. If they don't answer the first time, call again. There's a lot of patients, you know. You can't keep track of them all. Diana walked back to the subway. A useless can of borscht, which she had so lovingly prepared, was hanging in her bag. She understood about the intensive care unit. It was a place where people were put when they got sick. But what is saturation? And why was grandma's saturation low? She had to ask the nurse all these questions. And most importantly, would her ordeal ever end? Daddy, only daddy could help her. She pulled out her phone and hit the call button on Messenger. Silence. He hadn't answered her yesterday either, but she had called him late at night. The girl still couldn't remember the difference between her city and Africa. Daddy never told her what time it was in the city where he was. Diana pressed the call button again and again. Silence. Not one funny picture. Not one smiley face. Dad was gone. That hurt worse than a knife. After all these years, he'd appeared in her life and disappeared again. But her heart refused to believe in her father's perfidy. No, something had happened to him. Just like mom. Just like grandma. It's just a pity that there's no one there to help him. He's all alone there. Their usual conversation always took the same turn. She would ask daddy to come back to her, and he would explain for a long time why it was impossible. He had a very beautiful voice, like a newscaster or a politician. The girl tried to change her father's mind, refusing to believe that adults can be so stupid and vindictive. It's hard for me to come back, Diana, sighed the father in such cases. I hurt your mother terribly. I hurt her to death. She'll forgive me. Diana said to herself over and over again. After all, her mother, so strong and successful, so lively and determined, always forgave her daughter. Was her daddy really that much different? If he had come back a little earlier, nothing would have happened to him there in the faraway land of Africa. Immersed in gloomy thoughts, Diana went down to the subway. It was indeed a mechanism that always worked. The trains underground, like giant toys, kept moving forward and it seemed to her that these huge, solace machines didn't care what happened to the occupants. Like the escalators, they would keep moving, no matter what happened outside. Daisy was rewriting her own letter of resignation for the third time. The calculation didn't allow her to resign, otherwise she'd get a regular pension, not a civil servant's, 
and the difference was enormous. The principal didn't want to be part of the play John was putting on. Removing a child from a family is always stressful, but the Stone's case was special. In her long career as a teacher, she'd seen a lot of troubled families. She was impressed by the mother who left her young children home alone and went on multi-day trips to visit, or a father who for some reason decided that his son should eat sunshine and vegetable broth. In all seriousness, but these were all extremes inevitable in huge cities. The situation of the Stones seemed to demand a very different approach. Not the formal approach that the administration suggested, but a creative one. Raised on ideals, the principal struggled to remember what could have been offered at that time. Perhaps an apartment would have been found for them, and they would have found her crippled mother some kind of a job. And we lost, we lost. The official from the administration was terribly angry with her after Friday's council. He said a lot of ugly words, scolded her for indecision and incompetence. What does he know? How long had he worked at the school? So Daisy was determined to leave. Good thing her seniority and age allowed her to ask for a resignation. If they said two weeks, that's fine, the official said, waving his hand. So the same Friday, come as a group. Take the district inspector. Make the most vicious, the most defamatory report and take the child away. Is that clear? The principal still couldn't write six lines without mistakes. Resignations were supposed to be handwritten. As an experienced teacher, it was completely incomprehensible to her. Why such a mundane document would not be entrusted to a computer. After making another mistake, Daisy grabbed the paper and tore it up in a rage. Once she was alone with her thoughts, two antagonists appeared alternately in her mind. John, the administration official for whom numbers mattered most, and Casey Stone, who demanded human feelings and participation from her. Each of them is right in his own way, the official is worried about something irreparable happening. When a man is in trouble, he's capable of anything. And in this case, it's better to be reassured than to rely on risk. A woman in a wheelchair wants to be helped. She has every right to be helped. But by a strange coincidence, Daisy can't give her a hand. The petition kept failing. This time she cut it off on the first line, writing forgiveness. Very symbolic. She really needed forgiveness. What should we do? The girl must have relatives. She has to, at least a father. If John was so keen for her to get a policeman involved, why not ask him for help? The police have a very wide range of possibilities. Now the girl called the hospital every day morning and evening. The woman on duty patiently told her about the lack of change in her grandmother's condition. This expectation put pressure on Diana, but it was even more difficult for her mother. She called the hospital too, but it looked different. She dialed the numbers and stared at the screen for a long time. Hesitating to press the green button, Diana stood at the entrance to the divine, waiting for one of the adults. In front of strangers, this rascal will certainly not dare to exercise in wit. Although the girl vowed not to go to the store with an angry saleswoman, there was nowhere to go. They had too many tasks for the weekend. And in the evenings, Diana practiced pass, standing in front of the mirror, so going to a normal store in the next neighborhood would mean giving up class. And today it was vital for her to do stretching, then poured breath, plies, and badmints. It would help take her mind off her thoughts because of daddy's silence. She didn't know what to think anymore. After a minute of waiting, some uncle in a long coat walked up. He smiled at her and carefully opened the door. What? It won't budge, he asked. Come in, little girl. When Julian saw the girl at the door, she opened her mouth for another witticism, but stopped herself. It was the first time she'd ever seen a man in a coat, and her cardinal rule was not to attack strangers. She didn't know who he was. Maybe Jacob had sent him to check up on her. Judging by the decent coat, he wasn't from around here. I'll have to bite my tongue. Come in, I'll serve you, she said as friendly as she could. And you, girl, don't steal anything. No, no. The man waved his hands. He took the saleswoman's barb as a joke. First the girl, or you really need to keep an eye on them. What are you going to buy, little girl? Oh, I need a lot of things, said the girl, and beets and carrots. Let you first. No, the man insisted. I'm in no hurry. Do you want me to help you? Satisfied, Diana left the store. What a polite uncle. I wish her daddy was as kind and polite. Her phone rang. 
Mommy. The girl ran on. Here is the house. It is good that they live on the first floor. The distance to the front door she covered in two jumps. Mommy, screamed the girl, running into the house. A wave of heat and dampness hit her in the face, and her feet began to slap as if running on a puddle. Did mom spill water? thought Diana. Unlikely. Everything was in the water. The walls, the ceilings, the floor. Her boots were instantly soaked with liquid. Diana, we have to collect it. Mom shouted. Immediately collect. The girl rushed into the bathroom, took a bucket and a rag. But there was so much water that the bucket was instantly full. So she took a scoop and started scooping the water with it. The heavy bucket was so hard to lift to pour it into the toilet. Mom, what's going on? The girl asked. We've been flooded, Diana. Casey managed to find the culprit. She was told over the phone that the faucet in the fourth floor kitchen caused the problem. The upstairs neighbors were at work and didn't notice the leak until it reached the first floor. It was everywhere, pouring from outlets, tripping from the walls, tripping from the ceilings. The emergency crew shut off the supply. Now they had no water either. Diane took out at least 10 full buckets before the dustpan was useless. Then she began to collect water with a rag and wring it out. This struggle with the communal element lasted at least two hours. Squeezed out like her own rag to collect water, the girl fell to the floor. She was all wet from work and fatigue. Diana, get up, Mom said. Get up. You have to change your clothes. You'll get sick. I can't, replied Diana. No strength. Come on, daughter. Casey surveyed the damage. The already unpretentious apartment looked like a brothel. Wallpaper was peeling off the walls and ceiling. Door frames were swollen. Turning on electrical appliances was out of the question. So, through the fault of a negligent neighbor, they found themselves in a most depressing situation. Diana finally found the strength to get up. She took off her wet clothes and hung them on the radiator. We should open the windows, Casey said. It'll get the air out faster. Just get dressed first. By 9 o'clock p.m., the management company came to the apartment. The engineer meticulously described all the damage. Affected the kitchen, the corridor, and grandmother's room. It is closest to the epicenter of the attack. Some of the furniture's in the dumpster. Casey and Diane's rooms were spared. The water just dripped through the floor to them without causing any damage. Don't worry, said the man who identified himself as an engineer. We will definitely help you restore everything. And we'll help you with the furniture. Everything, Diana asked hopefully. Yes, he nodded. We'll wallpaper and whitewash the ceilings. It's our plumber, be damned, who hung the faucet badly. Damn him. Can you start tomorrow? Casey asked. The thing is. I'd love to, said the engineer. But I'm sorry. It takes two weeks for it to dry. It can't be sooner than that. It's the law. Casey thought about how laws can only work when they work against her. I strongly disagree with your act, Casey said. We were flooded two days ago. Well, you can file an objection. A week after the humiliating council, on a Friday, the delegation showed up unannounced at Casey's house. Diane was at school, and that's a good thing. She would definitely yell at these solace, heartless women. The committee meticulously inspected the rooms, looked in closets and the refrigerator. Two women kept marking things in their papers. I wish they'd help, Casey said. How am I supposed to change the wallpaper? I have an allowance of $150. I can barely exist on that money. If you can't do it, if you can't handle it, just say so, her guest told her. The mental strength that had come to Casey not so long ago was again on the verge of exhaustion. The only thing that pleased her was that the pain in her back did not return, even when she raised her arms high above her head. It must have been that after the mental torment, physical suffering was simply impossible. The girl's room was fine, the inspector summarized, but the common areas need urgent repairs. Didn't you hear that? Casey asked. I told you, we're flooded. You go out into the entryway and there's water stains all over the place. I heard, said the woman, but you didn't hear me. We need to get this place fixed right away. Soap, 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 soap. Start over. When Casey was given the report, she began to read it carefully and make handwritten notes, which caused displeasure of the inspectors. She did not leave a single line without caustic remarks and comments. At some point, 
The women accepted that they would not be able to get out of here quickly and began to wait. One of them said, the deadline to eliminate the remarks is a week. We need to re-wallpaper, change the floors. Bring your tools, I'll get started. Very funny, said one of the inspectors. We understand the situation you're in and humanly sympathize with you. But why should the child suffer? When Diana got home, she saw her mom in tears. She didn't roll out into the hallway to greet her like she usually did. Sitting in front of her laptop, she was browsing some websites. Tears rolled down her cheeks. Mom, hi, Diana said, and I called the hospital. Can you believe it? Grandma's already been disconnected from something. From what? Casey asked fearfully. Is that it? I still haven't figured it out, Diana admitted. I thought she couldn't breathe, but now she can. Thank God, Mom said. We should go see her. At least give her a message from us. I'll go tomorrow, Diana promised. Mom, have you been crying? Yes, sweetie. Mom, but you told me not to give up. That you have to be strong. Have you forgotten? No, I haven't forgotten, Casey said, wiping away her tears. But sometimes it's okay to cry a little. The important thing, my dear, is to stop in time. Diana went into the kitchen. The wooden floor had heaved and now resembled an obstacle course for toy cars. The air was still damp with water evaporating from the surfaces. She made her mother some tea and a couple of cheese sandwiches and brought them into the room. Diana didn't want to eat. Mommy, you're not going to give me to them, are you? The girl asked. No, darling. You and I will always be together, no matter what happens. The week went by quickly, even too quickly. That Friday, Diana decided not to go to school. If it was her last day at home, she'd rather spend it with her mom. Besides, she had never skipped a class. It was time to start. She could take her time, make a simple breakfast, watch TV together. If the weather was nice, they could try to go outside. Diana went to the kitchen, looked in the refrigerator. Not much. There were three eggs in the door and two mushrooms in the vegetable compartment. She'd also found a couple of sausages and a tiny piece of cheese. She beat the eggs, added the sliced sausages and mushrooms, topped it all with the rest of the ketchup, crumbled the cheese and poured it into the pan. It made a great omelet that tasted like pizza. I take it you didn't go to school. Mom asked, eating her breakfast. No, Diana answered. I don't feel well. I understand, Mom nodded. If the school board comes, they might take you away. Let's not think about bad things, the girl asked. You'll still be able to visit me, if anything. Or I'll run away and come back to you. They were silent for a while. Diana put the kettle on the stove. How good it is to have breakfast like this without hurry to talk to a dear person. It used to be like that, but it was her mother, not her, who worked on the stove. Would anyone think of separating them? Suddenly the bell rang. 9.30 in the morning, are they crazy? Go and see, Mom asked with a smile. On the doorstep stood a young man with a large box. Like a wizard, he rummaged through it, pulled out a package and handed it to her. Delivery service, the young man replied. Here, sign here. But, but we didn't order anything. The girl was surprised. We have nothing to pay with. Strange, the address seems to be the same, shrugged the courier. We don't need to pay. It's a prepayment. I'll ask, Diana replied and took the box. With it, she went to the kitchen. Her mother was sitting there, smiling strangely. Diana had not seen her so satisfied and even happy for a long time. Open it, she said. Diana took out the box, lifted the lid. Point shoes, the very real ones, white in color. The girl's hands trembled with excitement. She put them on her feet. They fit just right. She stood on her tiptoes and began to do the movements she had learned herself in front of the mirror. There's not much room in their narrow kitchen. Happy birthday, Mom said. Did you think I'd forgotten? Oh, Mom, thank you, Diana replied. I forgot myself. But where did the money come from? You won't believe the daughter, said Casey. I earned it on the internet. You saw me on my laptop for two weeks. It was a real miracle. Diana rushed to the door to thank the courier, but he was already gone. In the window of the first floor was visible as he dragged his box and checked with the navigator. What a job, the girl thought. He must be exhausted by evening. Did you think I didn't know your secrets? Her mother winked at her. How can I tell you, Diana shrugged. There's no secret. 
I always wanted to be a ballerina. No sooner had they finished their tea than the bell rang again. It was timid, even hesitant, as if the visitor was hesitant to come in. Casey froze with her mug raised. Is it really so early? She asked. I thought they were coming tonight. Don't give up, Mom, the girl said. The bell rang again. Diana went to the door and peered through the peephole. She expected to see Daisy, her classmate, and other familiar people, so much for the school not showing up. Instead of a huge delegation, there was a man standing there. Something about his face seemed familiar. She seemed to have seen his picture somewhere before. Hello, Diana said. Who do you want? Hello, whispered the man and smiled. Daddy, shouted the girl, opening the door wide. What the hell is this? Jacob looked around his store and couldn't believe his eyes. What had his surf done? There was a proud sign on the door, written in marker, recount, when had it closed. All the aisles were littered with cardboard boxes with the same marker indicating the type of goods and their quantity. Some with milk, kefir, and cheese were carefully placed in refrigerators. What the hell is this? Jacob asked, grabbing Juliana by the sweater. I'm asking you, what is this? Get your hands off me. I'm quitting, the sales girl replied. How dare you? The owner was outraged. Here, take a look, Julian said, and handed him a whole notebook written in her hand. I've counted it all. There's a shortfall, but it's a tiny 3,000. I put it in the cash register. What do you think you're doing? Jacob said. His whole pavilion is only 50 square meters with the warehouse. That's exactly what he needs to sell alcohol, the basis of his prosperity. Jacob made the most of this modest space, the merchandise is everywhere, in the refrigerators on the counter, and even in the aisles. But another important part of this success is Julianne, whose ex almost drove him into the world. Of course, in the 500,000 he wrote absolutely all the shortages over the years in the store. But the uncomplaining sales girl swallowed it. She didn't argue. She worked a double shift. Julian, let's talk. Jacob suddenly turned from anger to grace. You're supposed to give me two weeks' notice. I'll find a replacement. No, you won't, the sales girl said. We have an employment contract with you, remember? Jacob tried to give the appearance of obeying the law. Julian did indeed work for him officially. But since he couldn't afford a lawyer, he had to handle the paperwork himself. Had he missed the end of her contract? Julian, you can't do that, the landlord said. We can talk. I'll cancel some of your debt. Debt. Julian wrinkled her face. I paid it all off. I'm leaving. Out of the way. What about the police? Jacob said hopefully. Court. Go ahead, answered the former saleswoman. She pulled off her apron, the only uniform her stingy employer had provided her with, and threw it on the floor. Opening the door, she slammed it hard, hoping to break the glass, but it stood. This was not how he'd envisioned this meeting. Steve had thought the door would swing wide open in front of him and he'd walk in with a winning gait, handing out gifts. Casey, realizing and forgiving, would rush to hug him. But instead of his cheerful daughter, he sees a thin and haggard Diana. Does she even eat anything? Wallpaper hung from the ceilings and walls. In the kitchen of the old, shabby apartment sat Casey, sitting in her wheelchair. She covered her face with her hand in embarrassment. Of course she. This? The principal interjected. My resignation. I'm resigning. It's my legal right. Oh, your legal right? The official raged, right? So this is how you do my bidding? Coffee for us, he demanded, but no one came forward to do his bidding. John couldn't understand why this obedient and uncomplaining woman was suddenly rebelling. He must bring the process to an end and take Diana away from her negligent mother. What did it matter why she couldn't fulfill her duties? And so, at the last moment, the principal stabs him in the back. At 6 o'clock p.m., I'm closing the office, she says, and I'm leaving. And the stones. I'm not going to the stones, the principal said, period. That's okay, the official replied. Nothing. There will be teachers here to do my bidding, and you, Daisy, will be ashamed. That day, Diana finally felt like a little girl. Yes, she had just turned 11 so she might as well be a little weaker than adults. That, it turns out, doesn't know the city at all. Together with him, they looked for shopping centers on the internet, went there, walked around. It seemed that Daddy wanted to catch up on all the years he had missed. 
Diana could not relax and constantly looked at the prices, how expensive everything was. But Daddy put his arm around her shoulders and told her it was nothing, that he could afford a lot of things. But the girl still tried to choose things cheaper. It's a great jacket, she assured her father. Very warm. It's too short for you. Dad replied, take it off immediately. Then there was a cafe where Dad ordered her a small cake with a candle. The animator sang congratulations to the whole shopping center, and the visitors clapped her from the tables quite sincerely. They didn't get home until the evening. Diana was happy. She had not been given so many presents for a long time. Is it all true? There was a noise in the entrance. The girl recognized a familiar voice. It seemed to shout psychologists from school. Around her gathered a whole delegation, which was cramped in the corridor of an old panel house. But the mother, sitting on a wheelchair, steadfastly held the defense. And I'm telling you that she's not here, she said irritably. She's out walking, and I won't let you into the apartment. Then I'll call the police, the psychologist replied, and they'll take you to the police station for hiding your daughter from us. I'm not hiding from anyone, said Diana. Hello. There she is, the psychologist said cheerfully. Let's get a report. Let's take her in. Steve felt afraid. Where were they going to take his daughter? He came back to her after all these years to lose her all at once. He took a step forward and covered Diana with his large figure. The educators looked at him in surprise. Who are you? One of them asked. I am the father, he answered. How dare you? Casey shouted. We are a well-to-do family. Woman, said the psychologist arrogantly. If you bring a man home, it doesn't always indicate well-being. This is my husband, said Casey. Passport, the psychologist demanded. Steve pulled out a document and held it out to the delegation. Each member of the delegation, in turn, examined his passport. After a long journey, the appearance of the document left much to be desired, but the page with the stamp of marriage registration and the birth of a child had been preserved. I don't understand anything, the psychologist stretched out. How did we miss it? But I understand everything, Steve said and grabbed his passport. He suddenly felt strong. Get out of the way, can't you see? The child is tired and wants to rest. The man moved the school delegation, as it seemed to him, with a slight movement of his hand. In fact, they parted on their own. Steve let Diana go through, glanced over his shoulder. He was about to close the door, but then he thought it would be polite to be polite. We're a normal family, he said. We are. Just leave it alone, that's all. Be happy. Used to be so strong, so powerful and independent. Life had taken its toll on her. Steve held out to her in embarrassment the bouquet he bought at the train station. Bright red roses, just the way she liked them. Here I am, he exhaled. I'm back. Casey was silent. He could read a range of feelings in her gaze, but hate wasn't one of them. I wondered if she'd file for divorce. That last time, four years ago, when she refused to see him, he'd snapped, found a job three miles away and left. He hasn't been back to this home country of Russia in over three years. And a year ago, Facebook offered him a new friend with the same last name and familiar facial features. Diana turned out to be all grown up. They communicated for a year, and then he realized he couldn't be away from his daughter anymore, especially when he received a call from a schoolmate saying that he was wanted by the principal of the school where Diana studies. True, he'd never been told about Casey's accident. Papa, I'm so glad, Diana said. How about some tea? Casey remained silent, and Steve stood holding out the flowers to her. Then the girl took them and put them in a three-lighter jar. They didn't have a vase at home. She suddenly realized that she had not imagined meeting her father at all. There were almost no childhood memories of him, just of going to the movies and once eating ice cream. I'm sorry, Casey, he said after a long silence. It's my fault. I gave in. Casey was silent. Steve kept wondering if his wife had filed for divorce. He certainly wouldn't have done it himself. On his passport, they were still husband and wife. An inner strength prevented Casey from not only asking for help, but even accepting it. All she had to do was say two words about the state she was in he would have flown in, rushed over. But she didn't say a word. If you won't forgive me for your own sake, then forgive me for your daughter's sake, Steve asked. I can see you're having a hard time here. I don't know, said Casey. I don't know if you can stay with us. After everything you've done, or rather, what you haven't done, 
I don't know either. Steve shrugged. That's the way Casey's always been. If a man is strong, he measures others by himself. He sees any weakness as a betrayal. He'd always been weaker than she was. His wife's expressive silence hit him worse than any shout. He wanted to get up, rush outside, and run, run to the airport, fly far away from here. But he felt in his gut that both his daughter and his wife needed his help. Why don't we take a vote? Diane suggested it. All those in favor of daddy staying? I'm in favor. Casey was silent. Diana could see in her mom that she was hesitant. She wants to be a proud, independent woman, but they can't do it without her dad. Turns out he didn't fool her into coming, and just when she needed him most, who dare keep them apart now? Me neither, Steve said. I want to stay with you. If not right here, I'll get an apartment somewhere. I'll come and help out, take Diane to school. She's doing it on her own, Casey said sharply. You should have asked her if she had winter clothes and shoes. That's right, Steve shouted happily. And you and me, Diana, we're going shopping now, aren't we? And we'll take your mother, won't we? He looked hesitantly at Casey's legs, covered with the blanket. He would have liked to ask what had happened and what the prospects were, but he was afraid of making his wife angry, afraid she'd change her mind and kick him out the door. If she wanted to, he hastened to add, You two go, the woman said, I'll allow it. I've got things to do here. Daisy was determined that the play called removal of a child from a family would go on without her. She hasn't returned calls from administration officials. She sent her letter of resignation by courier. She has every right not to visit the girl and not to tear her from the arms of her loving mother. Really, there's nothing else the principal can do. No, she's asked not to let anyone in. The receptionist said, Daisy is very ill. Out of my way. The authoritative voice was John's, of course. He swung open the door to the headmaster's office and entered regally. The principal really wasn't well. The official weighed her application, holding it up with two fingers in a squeamish manner. Look what Daisy's been up to. Explain, John demanded. What is this? The parents stood dumbfounded when they saw the boy, a carbon copy of their twins, at the train station. A six-year-old boy stood in the middle of the station square, he was scared, looking around, and didn't know where to go. Are you lost? A strange woman in a brightly colored outfit approached him. Yes, tears were about to roll from his eyes, but he held them back. Come with me, she held out her hand to him. The boy gave her his hand, and they walked through the crowd. At one point, he was frightened, broke free, and ran. Where are you going? The gypsy woman shouted after him, but he ran without looking back. The boy saw that the doors of the wagon were open and ran in. This very wagon was not attached to anything, it had just been standing there for many years. The boy walked along the doors, went into one of the compartments, sat down on the seat. It was warm and there was no one there. Mom, he looked out the window, but there was no one there on the tracks. When it got dark, he was hungry, his stomach was rumbling, but he realized that if he left here, he would be picked up and taken away, and he didn't want that, because his mom would come back and he wouldn't be here. How would she find him then? He cried. Now that he was alone, he could do it. After that, he didn't notice how he fell asleep. Hey, is there someone here? He heard male voices in the night and opened his eyes. He was scared. Come in, there's no one here, said another voice. Presently, two men climbed into the same wagon where the boy had been. They started rustling something, swearing, the boy heard it all. He looked like a mouse. Come on, let's have a proper sit down, said one. What don't you like here? The other one answered him. Narrow, opened the compartment door of the one who wanted to sit down. He dragged some kind of sack in and then he himself fell into the cramped space. Oh, they heard a child's cry. Who? The man started to look around, but it was dark. Now, flicked a second liar. How are you doing? They saw the kid. Mom left it. He crawled out from under the table. How did you leave it? Permanently or temporarily? The men were stunned to find a small child here. She'll be back, the boy said pitifully. What's your name? 
one of his buddies leaned over to his face. Alex, who was smearing a tear down his cheeks. Don't cry, Alex. Everything will be fine. Your mom will come. The other one ruffled his hair. They, not paying attention to the boy, sat down and began to put everything in the bag. And there was a lot of stuff, mostly jewelry. They had just come back from a job that had gone well today. And now they were dividing up the loot. Anthony, why did you give yourself so much money? One of them started to get indignant. Don't yell, I'll be right there. They were flicking the lighter back and forth to get a glimpse. Are you hungry? Asked the one called Anthony at the boy. Yes, he nodded. Alex's eyes were so big when he saw it all. The man took bread and lard out of another bag, broke it off, gave it to the boy. Thank you, the man said. Together they spent the whole night here. When it started to get light, Anthony and his friend just left. Come on, Paria, don't be sour. Mom will definitely come today. They told him goodbye and left him a gingerbread. Alex looked out the window again. He was waiting for her to appear. But Mom was not there. It made him so sad that tears ran down his face again. Now when it was light, he saw that there were blankets on top. They were all dusty and torn. But Alex didn't care. He was freezing. Slowly, he pulled one out. Pulling it up, the others fell in after him. The boy wrapped himself up, put it on the shelf and waited. In the evening, he tried to go to sleep quickly, not to think and not to be afraid. And in the morning, they found him. No, not his mother, but the station workers. They were looking for the two men who had shared the loot last night. They saw that the carriage was unlocked. They decided to check, and there was the boy. Who are you? Where are your parents? A policeman asks him here at the station. I'm Alex. Mom's gone somewhere. I'm lost. He wanted to cry again. Where did she go? The man asked the small child. I don't know. I couldn't help but cry. Okay, I see. We need to call custody. He got up from his chair. The station master walked into the office Word had reached him that a little boy was lost. He saw him and smiled. Were you with your mom? He leaned over and asked him. Yes, nodded the man. I've never seen her leave a child like that, the man said in a half voice. Do you know his parents? Where did she go? The man asked the small child. I don't know, I couldn't help but cry. Okay, I see. We need to call custody. He got up from his chair. The station master walked into the office. Word had reached him that a little boy was lost. He saw him and smiled. Were you with your mom? He leaned over and asked him. Yes, nodded the man. I've never seen her leave a child like that, the man said in a half voice. Do you know his parents? Yeah, and I'll call them right now. He pulled his phone out of his pocket. Alex heard all this and couldn't believe that his mom would come for him again and they would be happy. He sat down on the chair and looked at the door to see when it would open. Not an hour later, a woman burst into the office. Her eyes were frightened. She looked at the boy, and Alex sat and thought that she should leave as soon as possible, because she was blocking his view. Katie and Selena met and saw each other for the first time at school when their parents brought them there. The girls immediately sat at the same desk, my name is Selena, she turned to her desk mate, and I'm Katie, the first grader told her back then. Shall we be friends? They both laughed. Yeah, Katie was okay with that. From that moment on, the girls were inseparable. They were always and everywhere together. They went to school, did their homework, and played outside. Their parents were happy that Selena and Katie had formed such a close bond. It's good if they carry that friendship through life, said Sarah, Selena's mother. Yes, they are like sisters, Olga Ivanovna, Katie's mother, agreed with her. The girls really thought they were sisters. If something happened at school, they stood up for each other. One didn't learn, the other gave advice. They did everything together. Come to my place tonight, Katie told Selena. What are we gonna do there? They were already in fifth grade. I don't know, we'll play something. Katie started to remember what toys she had. Okay, just for a little while, 
or it's a lot of assignments, Selena agreed with her. So they met every night, one or the other. Everything was fine with the girls. They did not think about any guys or discos. They were still young, so they had only toys on their minds. What do you want to be when you grow up? Asked Katie to her friend. I haven't decided yet. I guess I'll be a teacher, she said. And what are you? And I want to become a doctor, the girl answered with such a serious look. Oh, they say you have to study to be a doctor for a long time, Selena said smartly. It's okay, I'll help people later, Katie was sure of it. Time moved on. Now that the girls were not so young that they could go anywhere, their mothers decided to send them on vacation. They found out what vouchers were available, and for the summer the girls went to one big and famous camp in the south. They had a good time there and came back happy and tanned. How did you like it? Their parents asked them. Of course, if there are vouchers for next year, make sure we get one. The girls knew they wouldn't be bored. As the new school year began, Selena and Katie were still just as inseparable. Will you come over to visit tonight? After school, Katie asked. I don't know today. It's back to school tomorrow, her friend told her. Come, I'll show you something, Katie told her conspiratorially. What? Selena even got curious. When you come, I'll show you. Her friend didn't bother to tell her everything. Selena came home. She couldn't even imagine what Katie wanted to show her. Everything she had in the house, she had seen a long time ago. Then the girl remembered that Katie kept talking about some kind of basement. She said that when they moved, her parents had shoved everything she had into that basement. Maybe she had gone to that very basement, and now she wanted to show it to Selena. She quickly did her homework, left her mom a note saying she had gone to Katie's, and went outside. Her friend didn't live too far away, so within 10 minutes, Selena was at her place. Well, what's there, intrigued and you can't tell? She couldn't wait to find out what Katie had found and wanted to show her. Come on in, I'll show you, smiled her friend. Selena went into the room where her grandmother offered her tea. The girl agreed because she knew that the woman made very tasty scones. While the grandmother went to the kitchen, Katie called the girl into a small room. They sat down at the table and her friend took out an iron case. What's that? Selene didn't understand. I'll tell you a story, you won't believe it, she told her. My parents and I decided to dismantle our basement because there was a lot of junk taking up space. I asked to go with them, and we went. Just starting to tell Katie, as at that moment Grandma came in and put two cups of tea and a whole plate of scones on the table for her. Thank you, they answered her with glee. Eat to your heart's content. Grandma left the room and closed the door behind her. So when we were in there, I saw my old toys dolls, railroad, and all that stuff. But I wasn't interested in it anymore, so we put it all in boxes and took it out to the yard. But there was still a lot of stuff in the basement, and when we went down there the second time, Dad said we should throw it out the old dresser. Mom and I started pulling out the drawers to make it easier, and in one of the drawers I saw this box. I was so curious, I picked it up. But I couldn't open it for a long time, Katie continued to say. And what? You never looked into it. Selene wondered. She couldn't believe it. Of course I looked in. But I didn't do anything. I left it to show you. She spoke as if it was someone's remains. Well, come on, open up. The girlfriend couldn't wait. Wait, that's not the whole story, stopped my friend Katie, as I was trying to open this box. My mom came up to me and asked me what I was doing in there. I showed her. She smiled came over, wanted to help me open it, she did it. It was really quick. Turns out it was just a matter of flipping some hardware off. Kathy told her all this. It was so mysterious and interesting. Selena couldn't wait to open the mysterious suitcase. Kathy looked at her friend, took hold of the iron bars and pulled them open. Selena saw several syringes, vials and other medicines inside. What's that? She looked at her friend, it wasn't very intriguing. Come on, look at these syringes. She pulled one out of the box. It was glass. Well, yes, glass syringes, 
that's interesting. Took one and considered it Celine. My mom told me that this box belonged to my grandmother. The girl got up, opened the doors, and called out to the woman. When Veronica entered the room, she immediately noticed the iron briefcase that had once belonged to her. Grandmother, please tell us why it belonged to you and what you did with it, asked her granddaughter. Oh, girls, it's a long and sad story, Grandma told them. We're not asking you to tell the whole story, just tell us what you did with it. I was a nurse then, and that case really helped a lot of people. Now you have disposable syringes, you buy them at the pharmacy, give them a shot, and throw them away. In the past, there were glass syringes, reusable. With one syringe I went through the whole war. My grandmother was sitting and remembering what it was like then. There, Selena, there's a reason I wanted to be a doctor. Turns out my grandmother was one, and I'm following in her footsteps, Katie told her friend right away. Yes, she agreed. They sat for a long time looking at everything in the box. Other than syringes, there was nothing of interest. Let's play doctor, Katie suggested. Come on, and which one of us is going to be the doctor? Selena realized that, but asked anyway. Let's take turns, first me and then you. The girlfriend suggested. It was more fun that way. Kathy put on a white headscarf, went into the hall, sat down on the sofa, and waited for her patients to come in. Selena came into the room, holding a plush toy. Katie expertly placed the toy on a diaper, then examined it, drew some liquid from an ampoule into a glass syringe, and injected it into the toy. The tissue immediately turned a dark color. Here, this is where it hurts, the newly minted doctor said. What to do? Looked at her friend who had brought her a patient. We need to do surgery, Katie said. She took the blade and cut where the cloth had darkened and pulled out the dirty absorbent cotton that was soiled from the product in the syringe. That's it, I'm a doctor now, Selena told her. Then Kathy brought a similarly plush patient to see her and all the manipulations were repeated. After all that, the animals were sawn up. So they changed several times until Katie said she had no more plush toys to ruin it was Selena's turn, so she pouted her lips and said that Katie had participated four times in this game and she had only participated three. Okay, I'll find something, Katie went to her room. Then she brought out a doll that had a rubber head. How am I going to do her surgery if she's plastic? The girl wondered. So the head is rubber, Katie told her. Selena took the blade, held it to her head and started to make the cut. But not a few seconds later, the blade slipped and the whole thing went into Selena's arm. She screamed, but at that moment, her grandmother left the house. Katie, what do I do? Help me, screamed her friend. Katie took the real first aid kit they had at home, pulled out some sterile bandages and put them on her friend's wound before they treated it all with green tea and iodine. She started winding the bandage. She didn't spare it at all. It took the whole skein on her arm. Celine was in a lot of pain because when they pulled the blade out, they had opened the wound a little. She didn't know how she was going to go home or what to say to her mother. But from that time on, she realized that Katie was a bore medic. She really needs to go where she wants to go. That day at home, Selena was scolded by her mother as well as Katie for doing such a thing without adult supervision. What if it hadn't been a hand, but something else, or cut elsewhere, and so on, the parents said. All this time, the girls were friends, socialized, had many different adventures. And finally, the graduation, the end of all classes. Everyone was excited and prepared for this day. What are you going to wear? Asked Selena to Katie. I don't know. So we'll go with my parents to buy something. Hopefully we'll choose something, and you. And my mom bought me such a beautiful chiffon dress. I'll probably wear it. Selena said, Come on, when? Katie wondered. She began to remember the last time they had met. It had been in March, and her friend hadn't told her anything then. Just recently, maybe a month ago, now when I was leaving, 
He said he was coming to visit. Selena remembered Mickey. She felt sad. Wow, girlfriend. We'll be at the wedding soon, laughed Katie. Wait to talk about the wedding. You need to study a little, laughed that one. There was the whole summer ahead of us, where we could walk around and do the rest of our own things. At the end of July, Selena's young man arrived. Mickey hi, she greeted him. How I missed you, he hugged the girl. Come quickly, I'll introduce you to your friend. Couldn't bear to do it, Celine. They came in behind Kathy, sitting in her yard. I knew you didn't pick bad people, Mickey said of Kathy. Of course, how could I do that? Since I only ever have the best people around me, she giggled. In the evening, Mickey had to leave, and his girlfriends went to see him off. When will you come next time? The girl asked him. I'll probably already wait for you. September is only a month away. It's very hard for me to get out, the young man replied. There in town, he helped his father, moonlighting for him. Okay then. See you later. She kissed him on the cheek. Mickey climbed into the electric train and sped off into the distance. Man, Selena, he's so handsome, her friend told her. Are you jealous or what? Selena even hesitated. No way, what jealousy, just happy for my friend, Katie took a little offense. Come on, let's go home, she took her hand, and they walked down the sidewalk. The month went by very quickly, and the girls were away at school again. Mickey asked Selena to move in with him, but she refused. She was comfortable in the dormitory. Maybe it was fear of the young man's parents or something else that was stopping her. What if you and I got married? Mickey said. Well, when we get married, then we'll see. She wasn't going to do anything yet. No big moves. On New Year's Eve, the girl wanted to go home. She knew Kathy would come too. But Mickey said that Katie should come to their place and Selena should stay here. Selena didn't know whether to agree to that or not, but when she called her friend, she talked her into it, just as she had talked Mickey into it. The guy's house was packed with all the company, and his parents were there too. And after the chimes, he put a box in front of Selena. What is it? She looked at him with frightened eyes. Selena, marry me, he told her with a huff. Mickey, I knew you would do that. But it's still early. We're only in our second year. There's still so much studying to do. Why rush? She couldn't understand. So what would your answer be? He seemed to miss everything she had just said. Of course I agree. But I think it's very early. She stood up to him. Oh kids, I congratulate you. Mom got up from her seat and hugged them both. Katie was happy for her friend too. Selena still insisted on having the wedding in the summer when school was over. Mickey agreed to wait. And so, the next session was over. Selena came back to her place. Kathy was waiting for her at the entrance. So, friend, when's the wedding? She asked. In three weeks, as if you didn't know. Yeah, of course I know. It's just good to see you, they hugged. After that, the hassle began, which was very enjoyable for both girls. Dress, veil, shoes, everything was there. But then the argument began over where the wedding event would be held. Mickey insisted that everything was in his city, because he had friends and acquaintances there, and not only him, but also his parents. Selena, on the other hand, said that she wanted to do it in her town, where all her family and friends were. Eventually, the young man relented. Selena was glad that he did, Waiting for the wedding and preparing for it lasted so long, and the wedding itself flew by in an instant. No one even noticed what it was. I hope we'll live in that town. Her husband asked her after the wedding. Of course we study there, she laughed. Should we get an apartment or go to your parents' house? Of course, if money allowed, could rent an apartment. Selena was afraid to talk about it because she thought the guy would think she was mercantile. First we'll live at my place, and then we'll find an apartment, he concluded. Good, Selena agreed. She had more worries now. Not only did she have to go to school, but she had to do everything at home to please her mother-in-law. At some points, the girl just wanted to lie down and lie down. 
she was getting very tired. You're lying down again. Her mother-in-law told her, even though Selena had just laid down up for scrubbing the entire apartment. In general, the woman had a nose for it. As soon as her daughter-in-law sat down or dozed off, she was right there. That's it, that's it, I'm getting up, the girl reluctantly said, got up and went to do her business. After the third year, there was an internship. Selena decided to do it in the same city where she and her husband lived, although it was easier to get a job in her hometown. But as Mickey had said, that was the way to do it. Aren't you coming over? Katie called her. Probably not. I'll do everything here. Selena regretted it too, but there was nothing left to do. Then I'll visit you for another day, Katie said firmly. Okay, we'll be waking, the girl said goodbye. Life went on as usual. All the practices and sessions were over. Selena had to go to work. She was a graduate. Katie had one more year to go. Can I go to my mom's house and meet Kathy there? That Kathy, some flighty, bad influence on you. Mickey said and wrinkled his forehead. Play, she begged him. Okay, he agreed. They never rented an apartment. They still lived with her husband's parents. It couldn't help but get on her nerves. When her mother-in-law realized that they were staying here for a long time, she began to torment Selena. Hi, it's been so long since I've seen you, Katie pulled her friend close to her. And don't tell me, you know how tired I am. Selena took a seat on the bench. Husband, my friend guessed, and he too. They were sitting right there at the train station talking. Okay. Let's go. You can tell me about it later. Katie stood up and pulled Selena with her. The conversation didn't stop on the way. There was so much news that they couldn't wait to share. They both laughed as they visited Selena's parents first and then went to Katie's house. Selena, you just don't look surprised. Katie warned her. You and your secrets again. You've been like this all your life. The girl's used to it. They entered the apartment where Katie's parents were waiting. A young man greeted them on the doorstep. Hello. He greeted the guest gullibly, I'm Carlo. Celine, she stood looking at him. Yes, that's my fiancé. I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner. I was afraid of jinxing it. Katie bloomed with happiness. You motherfucker. My friend knew this was to be expected of her. They all made their way to the kitchen. There was talk of the wedding. Now Selena was going to help her friend in this endeavor. She'd stayed in this city a few days longer than she promised her husband. Why? Mickey asked into the phone. Katie's wedding is coming up. We need to help. She knew he'd start making up different versions again. Or did you get a boyfriend over there? Mickey was very jealous. What are you talking about? If you want, you can come yourself. Extra hands will not hurt, she offered him. You know I'm working. He didn't listen to his wife's excuses anymore. Hung up the phone. Well, my friend was standing next to me. As usual, nothing new. The girl didn't want to talk about it. Okay, don't feel bad. He's not going to kill you, Katie hugged her. After that, there was no time to think about Mickey and everything spun and spun. The wedding day was set and the young people were ready. I'll go home. Talk Mickey into it, and we'll come over, Selena promised at the train station. Okay, we'll wait to see how I am without a witness, they hugged again. Selena was walking up to the house. She wasn't expecting what was going to happen next. She's here, her mother shouted from the hallway as she opened the door for her daughter-in-law. Did you have a good time? Mickey's out of the room. And I told you there's a reason she goes there every time her mother coaxed. Come on, first of all, my parents are there. Second of all, my best friend's getting married. Selena didn't even get to take her shoes off. And third, lover boy, mother-in-law never left their side. Mickey, I didn't expect that from you. She finally took off her shoes and went into the room. If you go to the wedding, divorce right away, her husband told her. Then the divorce, she wasn't going to ditch Katie. There, see how quickly you agreed, and you said you had no one there, he jumped up from the couch. 
I don't have anyone there. Celine was already so sick of it all that she wasn't even looking for excuses. Why don't you call me with you? The husband continued. Before I could, you swooped in from the doorstep. She turned to him. Okay, I'll go. He sat back down. No one minded. Selena smiled. When the husband and wife were getting ready, the mother-in-law was so furious that her son did not listen to her. She talked about how her daughter-in-law had no shame or conscience, but no one paid attention to her words, which made the woman even angrier. I thought you weren't coming, but Katie was home doing her bridal makeup. If you knew what it was like back home, Selena didn't even want to remember it. Okay, I came with you. Her girlfriend looked at her through the mirror. At the registry office, everything was fine. Mickey stood by and didn't say a word. But at the restaurant, it started. A young man came up to Selena and asked her to dance. Mickey watched silently as his wife went with him. But as soon as she got to her seat, it started. Is that him? The husband asked. Who? She turned her head toward him. Then she realized and shook her head negatively. I see. So, with me you do not dance, and with anyone, went, indignant young man. Did you invite them? They'd start fighting. After that, Mickey didn't speak to her all evening. When we got to my mother-in-law's house, he made a scene there too. You know, Mom didn't know we had anything wrong with our relationship at all. She told him reproachfully. He knows now, he said with defiance. Do you often do this? The woman asked her daughter in the kitchen. Lately, constantly, Celine didn't want to talk about it. It's going to get worse from here, Mom said from the height of her experience. Okay, we'll figure it out somehow, Selena was already thinking about it herself. After all this, they returned home. Selena was offered a position at the school, which she didn't refuse, because it was impossible to stay at home. She and Katie began to call each other more often. In the last year of her studies, her friend worked part-time at the hospital, where she had an internship, and then was going to settle there for a long time. In Selena's family after she went to work, there were scandals every day, and her skirt is short, and she wears bright makeup. Do you do all this to make men pay attention to you? Her husband asked her at home. What are you talking about? A knee-length skirt is not a mini, she showed him. But it's all tight, he parried. What should I wear a burqa? She covered half her face and left only her eyes. Yes, he nodded, or better yet, stay home altogether. And listen to your nonsense. She went into the kitchen, but there was a new ambush. Why didn't you mop the floors today? Her mother-in-law asked. What floors? I was at work. I just got here. She wanted to come out of the kitchen. No, honey, you're not going anywhere until you talk to me. The mother-in-law closed the aisle. What do you all want from me? She was so tired. She was ready to go anywhere. To make you obedient. Not as you are now, the woman explained. What obedient? Am I a dog or a trained monkey? Selena couldn't help herself. No one said that. You said it yourself, smiled the mother-in-law. The girl pushed her away and went to the room where she and her husband lived. That's it, I can't do this anymore. She threw her things into her suitcase. Where are you going? Her husband looked surprised. Away from your family, as if sung together to drive me. She grabbed her bag and headed for the exit. Don't go, he almost got on his knees. Stand back, don't grovel, she stepped around him. Selena. Mickey looked at his mother. Let her go, she'll come crawling back later, the woman said arrogantly. The girl couldn't stand it anymore. She left the apartment and went to her colleague, whom she had befriended not so long ago. She knew that she wouldn't say no. Nancy, hi, she said hello to her as she opened the doors. Come in, what's wrong? The woman saw Selena come in with a large bag. Can I stay with you for a while? Then I'll tell you all about it, the guest asked. Sure enough, she took the bag from the girl's hands and carried it into the room. I'll settle things with work and the divorce now, and then I'll think about what to do, Selena said. 
Will you leave the collective? Nancy asked. I guess so. I can't be in the same city as Mickey, she said sadly. It's a pity to lose such a specialist. You are young, but you can do a lot of things. The woman shook her head. They sat in the kitchen for a long time, discussing the situation that had happened at Selena's. After that, they went to bed. Both of them had to go to work in the morning. Nancy asked me when she was ready to leave. She always got to school an hour early to get everything ready. Yes, I'll be right back. Just a few more minutes, the one said. The two of them came to the school. Selena decided not to procrastinate and to go to the principal at once. She explained everything. She asked her to finish the school year and then she would let her go. Selena went to the meeting. Nancy said she could stay with her for that time. Mickey was looking for meetings, but Selena wouldn't agree to them. She was afraid of the fact that she would feel sorry for him. She had put a stop to it a long time ago and she didn't want anything back. You're so resilient, Nancy told her. If you lived in that family, you wouldn't be like this, she laughed back. She filed divorce papers with only a year to go until the end of the year. After that, Selena was thinking of traveling to the city where she was born. Don't forget, they were saying goodbye to Nancy. Of course, she left her address and phone number with her. It was a shame to say goodbye to the staff. They were all so friendly, but it had to be done. Selena drove home. Daughter, how did you decide to do that? On what, exactly? I don't understand. For everything, divorce, come back. The woman was glad to have her daughter back together with her. I don't know, but it had to be done at some point. Selena didn't want to bring it up. Are you going to get a job? My mother asked. Of course, Celine looked up at her, not sitting on your neck. Okay, do you want me to call Sarah? The woman wanted to help her daughter. No, I want to do it myself. I've done it before, she denied it. Good, the mother was glad to have such a mature, sensible and independent daughter. As she planned, so she did. The very next day, Celine was already sitting in the principal's office. Sarah, I wish I could work at your school, Selena told her. Of course, I'd love to take you, but not now. All the seats are taken so far, the woman regretted. Okay, I'll wait. As soon as something becomes available, call me immediately. She wrote a phone number on a piece of paper. After that, the girl went home. There was nothing to do at all. Katie didn't come for the summer this time. She went straight to work after she got her diploma. Selena was envious that her friend was doing so well, married well and found a job right away. But she tried not to think about it. Six months passed. Nobody called from the school. The money Selena had was long gone and she wondered what to do. Selena, there's a phone call for you. Her mother put her on the phone. Hello, she approached. Selena, hi, it's Harvey, your classmate, remember? A male voice gibbered in the receiver. I remember not parts of it, she grumbled. I found out that you came to our city. I have John, my son. He is going to the first grade today, cannot study. Again, quickly spoke the young man. Is it that bad? She thought, wow. He was the most inconspicuous kid in his class, and he's got a kid going to school. No, we just want to be safe, he said with a pleading tone in his voice. Good, she thought. Why didn't she think of that before? Not for free, of course, but how much? He continued with his quick story. Oh, I don't even know. Bring as much as you think you need, and I'll find out later and tell you. She thought it was the first time she was doing it. Maybe it wouldn't work out yet. From that date on, children began to enroll with her. Of course, she couldn't take many, but she had a few regulars. And why go out to school when you can earn money at home too? Her mother praised her in the evening. I'm so tired, Selena sat eating soup. From the children? The mother guessed. No, the loneliness, the work, all of it. It's just so monotonous, she sighed. Call Kathy, go visit, see how things are going, the woman advised. Indeed, Selena had forgotten all about her friend because of her work, and she was good. She had only called a couple of times in a year. 
Maybe she has her own business and problems there since she doesn't call or come over. Selena thought calling or not calling. No one is going to hit you over the head. Just call and that's it, the woman insisted. She herself saw that it was time for her daughter to rest. Okay, it's late now, and tomorrow I'll be sure to get a girlfriend. If I'm lucky, I'll get a little vacation. She spoke her thoughts aloud. That was fine. Her mom was glad she'd pointed her in the right direction. Kathy, it's been so long since I've heard from you. She called the next day to a friend. Selena, hello, how many years? How many winters? rejoiced her friend at the call. You know, I wanted to come to your place. What do you think about it? Of course, what are you asking? You and I are like sisters, agreed to Toe's proposal. It's settled then, wait. I'll be there the other day. Selena didn't want to discuss anything over the phone. She knew they would talk about everything when they met. For a few more days, the girl accepted students who went to her. After that, she announced that she was going on vacation and cancelled all classes. She packed her bag. A day later, a train was waiting for her, which would take her to her favourite friend. And I've been waiting, Katie opened the door. Hello, they hugged. While Selena was dealing with her problems with her husband and her job, there were a lot of changes in Katie's life too. She got a job, just like she said her husband loved. He got a good job too. I see you have a full house, Selena said as she walked in and saw how her friends lived. Yeah, Carlo, you know how Carlo is. He does everything for me, not bragging, just saying girlfriend. Yeah, you're lucky to... How was your evening? She asked her husband. You have a great friend, he hugged his wife. I know that. Kathy was glad it was going so well. She went to her room and lay down as well, needing some sleep after a night on duty. It wasn't until Carlo came in for lunch that both girls woke up. Wow, Selena looked at her watch. You can sleep. Carlo laughed at her. It's been a long time since I've gotten this much sleep, she stretched. When the man left, the girlfriends got ready to go for a walk. Your husband said he was going to introduce me to some friend this weekend, Selena told her friend. Probably with Albert, she guessed. How do you know, did they talk about it? Selena thought it was all Katie's idea. And how could I not know my husband's friends? They are my friends too, she didn't elaborate. Confess your idea, laughed Selene. Why should you sit alone? You'll be in front of the man. He's a very nice guy, Kathy began to praise him. Then why did you split up? Selena wondered. Don't talk to him about it. It's a very bad story. His wife was going out left and right. Almost everyone knew except him. Once, at a corporate party, she was alone. He didn't go with her. And when it was too late, he decided to do a good deed to meet her. He came, and she was right on the street kissing her colleague. After that, they got into the car and drove away. That day, she came home only in the morning. He could not forgive and left. The friend told the story. Wow, there were no children? Selene clarified. No, Katie's gotten sad for some reason. Well, enough about sad things, come on. Show me what you have here and how. The girl translated the topic. All day long they went shopping, did some shopping, and then sat in a cafe. They felt like they had that time back again. When they were still enrolled in this city, it was so heartwarming and fun. So home. Katie got up from her seat. I'm not embarrassing you. For some reason, Selena thought of it just now. What are you saying? You'll get to know Albert. Move in with him. He has his own huge apartment and there's not enough mistresses there. They walked towards the house. Actually, I came to you for a few days and you already put me in a man, laughed the girl. We'll get you a job here too. Katie was sure of it. At home, it was the same as yesterday after Carlo came in. Happy talk at the table and after that bedtime. Saturday came, Carlo is promised, told his wife and Selena to get ready and he would go to the store and buy everything they needed. Gold, not a man, Selene glared at him. Spit or you'll jinx it, her friend muttered to her. Everything was ready and they drove off. 
Carlo had a small house, which they considered their summer house. The view here was fabulous. Selena heard a car making a noise, she turned. It was indeed coming towards them. Here comes Albert. Carlo came out to meet him. Hello everyone. A tall brunette came out of the salon. He took one look at Selena, and she was gone. Come on, I'll introduce you to Katie's friend. Carlo led him to her. Please love and welcome, my friend Albert. He introduced him to the girl. Celine, she blushed. Don't be so embarrassed or I'll start doing it myself, he said cheerfully. Good, she said. All together they entered the courtyard, the men going straight to the brazier while the women busied themselves with the table. So, how did you like him? My friend was curious. Pretty, she didn't mince words. You bet he is. Look at him. What he looks like. That's his personality, Kathy told me. Oh, you think we're gonna make it? Selena wasn't so sure. Albert was really handsome. He was afraid to start a new relationship because he thought he would be treated the same way again as the first time. So, buddy, how'd you like the girl? Carlo was threading meat on a skewer. Yes, she's pretty, cheerful, and modest, he said knowingly. Shall we take it? The comrade joked. We'll see. Albert didn't promise anything. No need to be afraid. Things weren't working out so easily in her life either, Carlo said quietly. I understand, nodded the friend. They were roasting meat that spread its aroma throughout the village. Well, here's to you ladies. Albert raised his glass. And we're rooting for you, the girlfriend said cheerfully. Solan, let's go talk. He offered her his hand. Let's go. She looked at her girlfriend, who winked at her. They went to the swing set, which was right there on the grounds. They were both silent as they walked. Did you come here? He saw her sitting on the swing, walk over to swing a little. Yeah, I hadn't seen Katie in a while, so I thought I'd meet up. Selena liked it here. How long have you two known each other? Albert wanted to know everything about her. Since first grade, once they sat at the same desk, they had never parted again. Selena smiled. He had already rocked her enough. Carlo and I went to school together too, the young man admitted. You're interesting. Selena didn't know why she said that herself. We'll meet again. Why'd you go away? He was curious. Yeah, I'll be staying at Katie's for a while longer. Selena looked in their direction. Carlo said you wanted to get a job here, Albert wondered. They're the ones who want me to stay here. She hadn't had time to think about it yet. And you? He stopped the swing. If only with you. She didn't realize how she'd said those words out loud, just thinking about it. Perhaps the wine was playing tricks on her. Albert froze. He couldn't find anything to answer. He just stood there looking at her. I'm sorry, she's on her feet. No, nothing, still his stupor hasn't passed. Selena went back to her friends. Now she was cursing herself for her language. Maybe Albert would think she was imposing and wouldn't want to talk to her anymore. What happened? Wondered the friends as they saw that the young man had remained standing there by the swing and Selene had come back. I'm such a fool, almost crying, the girl said. Explain normally what happened. Did you have a fight? Katie couldn't understand. Nothing happened. Everything is fine. Albert walked over to them and put his hand on Celine's shoulder. She froze and stood like that for a few minutes. Nothing more happened that evening. They talked for a long time. Then Albert and Carlo went to put out the brazier and Kathy and Selena cleaned up the dirty dishes. And yet, what did you get out of it? Her friend looked at Selena. I'll tell you later, she promised. We didn't get home until the next morning. Albert said goodbye and promised to call. Oh, Selena, if this works out, the girlfriend spoke dreamily. The next day, when all her friends were at work, Selena decided to go to the school to find out about vacancies. And to her surprise, they were there. The principal said she could hire her as soon as possible. Katie, and I got a job said a happy Selena in the evening. No kidding, was happy for her friend. Selena, you, Carlo called her on the phone. It was Albert. 
They talked for a good half hour after that Selena came into the kitchen all red. What are you, like a cancer? Katie thought they were fighting again. He asked me out on a date. Selena was excited. Everything was going around inside. So that's great news. Katie led her to her room. Get changed. Stop walking around in jeans and sneakers already. The girl put on the dress her friend gave her, shoes, some makeup on her face, she was ready. So that's how ugly ducklings become beautiful swans. Carlo met them in the hallway. What are you talking about? His wife shushed him. I'm sorry, you were already beautiful and now you're glowing. He complimented Selena. She held a cab and drove to the restaurant where Albert was already waiting for her. When she got there, his expression was about the same as Carlo's. Wow, that dress looks great on you. He took her hand and walked her to the table. No need to embarrass me, that, believe me, is enough, she was all red again. Why are you so embarrassed? He looked at her, that blush only adding beauty to the girl's appearance. I don't know, she shrugged. Okay, let's order. He held out the menu to her. Selena had chosen a light salad and meat for the hot meal. Albert had ordered something for himself and some champagne. Selena, after we met, I thought you could stay with me. I realized that you live with Carlo and Kathy. They have a family. You may be redundant, but they will never tell you that. I suggest you move in with me. We'll get to know each other, be close for a while and then we'll decide if we should start something or not," he said in a business-like tone that made Selena laugh. I don't even know, no one's ever offered her that before. Think, he poured champagne into glasses. Okay, I need to consult with Katie, best friend after all. She didn't mince words. Okay, now, let's have a nice evening, he sat across from her and kept looking at her. They danced. Selena could smell his perfume. She didn't know why, but it turned her head. Afterwards, Albert walked her home. Remember what you need to think about, he shouted after her. Good, she turned and sent him an air kiss. He pretended to catch it and tucked it into his breast pocket. Oh, Kathy, I like him so much, but I'm afraid to hurry in case he thinks something, she told her friend back home. What would he think if he offered... She didn't understand. Well, then I agree. You cannot miss this option. And suddenly, in a joint residence, I do not like it too, Selena decided. Look how well everything is going. She found a job, met a man. Now just wait for the wedding. And that's it. Everyone is happy, rejoiced Katie. Selena moved in with Albert. He waited for her, prepared a room. The first day, it was kind of awkward. Selena was embarrassed of him. He must have been embarrassed of her. Going for an interview tomorrow, she told him in the evening. Well done. Break a leg, he rejoiced. To hell with it, she laughed. After that, he suggested watching a movie. Selena didn't mind that. It was good for the two of them, but it was only the first day. In the morning, she went to school. As promised by the principal, she was accepted there everything was going well. Not a couple of days later, Selena was in a new team. How was work? Asked every evening Albert. He was very attentive. In a few weeks of living with him, the girl realized it. Very well. As long as I like everything, she replied. We should get together with Carlo and Kathy sometime, the man suggested. I was thinking the same thing. She was no longer blushing in his presence. The couples called each other over the weekend arranging to meet at the same place where they had been when Albert and Selena met. How are you guys doing? My friend started asking around. Everything's fine. Selene looked at Albert, looking to him for support. Yes, he nodded. You two aren't together yet? Carlo hurried things along. Wait, it's still early. Selena started to feel uneasy. After that question, it was never spoken of again. That evening, Albert spent more time with his friend. They were arguing about something, talking. It was good, because the girlfriends also needed to socialize. Katie, when are you going to make the kids happy? Selena asked. Date, she gestured for her to stop. Why? 
My friend didn't understand. Just, replied Katie sadly. Carlo doesn't want to. The girl guessed. No, it's more complicated than that. You could see she was having trouble broaching the subject. Okay, you can tell me yourself when you want to, her friend hugged her. We had to get back. Everyone had things to do in the morning. Selena washed her face, said goodnight to Albert, and went to her room. She made the bed and lay down. A few minutes later, there was a quiet knock on the door. It opened and Albert appeared. May I? He asked. Yeah, come in, what's wrong? She sat up in bed. No, I just want to spend this night with you. He crouched on the edge of the bed. Wow, Selena had expected anything but this. He had brought a blanket with him, in case she minded sleeping under one. Lay down on the other side of the bed. Why today? She didn't know where to start the conversation, or if it was even necessary. I realized you're the one I need. I think you've figured it out by now too. He saw the way she was looking at him. Yes, she said quietly. They lay there like two schoolboys, neither one daring to be the first to do anything. Selena, he moved closer to her. I really like you. And you to me, she felt him hug her. After that, their lips came together in a kiss. It was their first real kiss, which they would remember for a long time. In the morning, Albert got up early to prepare breakfast for his beloved. Usually she did it, but today, he wanted to make her happy. Hey, that smells good. She came out into the kitchen. Good morning here. Thought I'd make breakfast for you. He stood at the stove. Selena walked up to him and hugged him from behind. Thank you, she kissed his back. Aren't you late? He looked at his watch. No, I have another whole hour. She sat down on a chair and watched Albert put scrambled eggs on the plates. After breakfast, she quickly washed her face, got ready, and went to work. Albert did the same. He was so happy today that it could be felt physically. See so you tonight, love, he kissed her. Have a good day, she went. Selena couldn't help herself, and already at recess, she called Katie and told her everything that had happened to her last night. Honey, I congratulate you, she told her. Kathy really was happy for her friend. And things were only getting better from there. Albert treated his beloved beautifully, and she reciprocated him. Listen, Selena, I think yours is going to propose to you, Katie said into the phone. What makes you think that? Selena and Albert had been together for a year, but there was never even a hint of it. Yesterday, I heard Carlo talking to him. He thought I was in the bathroom and couldn't hear, my friend explained. And what were they saying there? Selena got worried. Something about a restaurant at a ring. I'm telling you, it's a proposal. Katie couldn't keep it from her friend. Okay, I hear you. Cheeks turning red with joy. Albert was calm until the weekend. They had business as usual. I want to take you out to a restaurant tonight. Carlo and Kathy will be there too. He told her Saturday morning. Okay, I'll be ready. She was calm. She couldn't concentrate on anything at work. Good thing there weren't many classes. She got home early, so there was plenty of time to get ready. Selena tried on all the dresses she had in her closet, but either because of excitement or something else, none of them seemed to fit her. Finally, she chose the one she was going to wear, put it on, arranged her hair and waited. Albert arrived without delay. The girl got into the car, let's go. For some reason, Selena began to shake. It was the effect of excitement. Her palms were so cold that it seemed that if she baked something now, she would immediately freeze. How was your day? Albert asked her. Great, she said. You're acting kind of weird. He noticed that she was all clenched up and looking only forward. No, as usual, she tried to speak calmly. Okay. He put his hand on her arm, felt it was icy, but didn't say anything. They pulled up, got out of the car, Carlo and Kathy were already waiting for them. What an event, we might as well have sat at the cottage, Kathy said. Let's go, not everyone goes to the countryside, we need to have a good rest, Albert called out to everyone. Now it was obvious that he was a little worried himself. The evening went as usual, 
everything was already ordered, so the waiter only brought the dishes. At some point, they'd brought champagne, before that they had been drinking wine. Friends, I have a confession to make, Albert said. He stood up. In what way? smiled Carlo. I fell very much in love with this woman, and I wanted her to be my wife, he said and handed Selena the ring. God, Albert, I love you so much. Finally, all excitement gone, she kissed him and put the ring on his finger. Congratulations, Carlo and Kathy said in a voice. Selena drove home happy. She looked at her husband-to-be and couldn't believe that this was even possible. Are you happy? He turned to her. Very much so, she leaned her head on his shoulder. Me too, he petted her. The next day, Selena called her mother, told her everything, and she promised to come. Albert suggested not to make a big celebration, to sign in the registry office, and then go to the countryside with friends. Selena was not against it. Mom arrived, Carlo, Katie and a few other people were invited to the wedding. Everyone was happy for the bride and groom, and they looked at each other and were so happy. Well, that's it. Everyone's on board now, Kathy said as she raised a toast. Thank you, Selena walked over and hugged her and Carlo. Yes, friend, I will never forget that. Albert shook hands with his comrade. Life went on. Selena wanted to get pregnant, but it wasn't happening. She went to her friend's house in the evening to talk to her because she was very close to the subject. You see, Katie, no matter how hard we try, it doesn't work, Selena told her. She spoke again in the quiet voice she'd used before when the subject came up. Will you just tell me? Selena knew that something was going on in the family of friends, but Katie kept quiet about it. Good, she looked straight into her friend's eyes. Well, she waited. When we got married, we were over the moon. This was the family. All that was missing was a baby's cry. But after a year, and then another, and still nothing worked, Katie was silent. Well, not all at once, Selena realized her friend was facing the same problem she was now. I suggested to Carlo that he should undergo a checkup. It was good that he didn't need to go anywhere. He could do it at our hospital, and he agreed. After we went to the doctor, it became known that Carlo would never be able to have children, she cried. Will you calm down? Celine hugged her. I understand and accept it all, but I can't get over it she said through her tears. You can take an infant. I can't believe you don't have anyone there refusing, Selena suggested. Carlo doesn't want to. He was very upset after that examination too. That's another matter, she realized, why her friend was in so much pain. Now you know everything, Kathy couldn't stop crying. Should we go through too? The girl asked her friend, of course, it's not forbidden to anyone, said the one. That same evening, Selena talked to her husband. He agreed to do it. And a week later, they had all the forms in hand, only to go through the doctors. When everything was done, all that was left was to wait for the results. Are you worried? Albert asked his wife. Briefly, they sat in the hallway outside the doctor's office. When he called out to them, Selena's legs became cotton. She felt like she couldn't walk at all. But her husband was there to help. Yes, indeed, you have some problems, the doctor said and wrote something down. You mean we're not having kids? Selena almost fainted. Why, there is a solution to that problem, the doctor told her. What was it? She was all ears. IVF, he told her in just three letters. We agree, while thinking Selena said Albert. You need to prepare, read all about it, then take all the tests again and come to the laboratory, said the medic with knowledge. We'll get it done. The husband took his wife's hand and they went home. How can it be, two friends, and both of them having such problems, Selena lamented. And what don't you like with what the doctor suggested to us? Even if it won't be the natural way, but still the same, Albert said. Yeah, I agree with you. She's thought about it before. In the evening, Carlo and Katie came to visit them. There were no more secrets on either side. When do you all start? Asked Selena's friend. The sooner the better, she said. Great, 
and I'll be your personal doctor, Katie smiled. Selena felt like she was jealous. Okay, agreed the girlfriend. What Albert and Selena had to go through. But lo and behold, the procedure had taken place. Now it needed time, whether it would take root or not. How are you feeling? Katie kept calling and asking. It's okay. Her friend answered her for the hundredth time. Great, no exercise, no intimacy with my husband or anything else, commanded by my personal physician. I obey, laughed Selena into the phone. Two weeks passed. Selena started to feel her breasts hurting. She called her friend to ask. Honey, I congratulate you. That tells me it worked out, Kathy practically shouted into the phone. Okay. Then I'll make an appointment for a checkup, she mumbled. Everything was going well. Kathy counseled every day, and she also took her to her first ultrasound. The woman who conducted it was surprised when three other people walked into the office besides her colleague. They were Selena Carlo and Albert. All on the ultrasound, she laughed. Yes, Caroline, you've already forgiven us, stepped closer to her Katie. Okay. She rubbed Selena's belly. Congratulations, you have not just one fetus, but a whole. Why did you stop talking? Startled Selene. I don't know, it looks like two. But what's this? She turned the device a little sideways. So how long? Albert couldn't wait. So far, I say two, nodded Caroline affirmatively. Great, we were afraid there might be more. Albert smiled. He helped his wife up. Everyone went home in high spirits. We sat there for a while and parted ways. Selena was happy. It was hard for her to go to school, to do her lessons, but she did it. Would you quit your job already? Her husband asked her. You what, I like it, she resisted. Look at the watermelon you're carrying on your back, he laughed, and right afterward, he came over and kissed her belly. She knew he was joking, so she never took offense. When she had to go on maternity leave, she couldn't take it anymore. She spent almost all her time in bed. Albert supported her as best he could. One evening, he got a call from work, saying that he needed to come there urgently. I won't be long, I promise. He leaned over and kissed his wife. She hadn't been feeling well since this morning. Please don't go, she held his hand. I can't. He realized he couldn't leave his wife either but at the same time, a fixed term contract. He put on his coat and left the house. He decided that as long as he started the car and stood in traffic, it would be long, it would be faster to walk. He ran to the road. It was a long way to the crosswalk. He decided he would just cross. He just ran out onto the road. A car came out of nowhere, brakes squealing darkness. Selena, I called an ambulance rushed her to the hospital. Katie came to see her. What's wrong? I feel better now. I have to wait for Albert, perplexed her friend. Get up, grab what you need, let's go. As if her friend hadn't heard her. Selena obeyed her. She was in charge of her pregnancy after all. She put on the dress. Katie helped with her shoes and they walked out of the entrance. They were at the hospital in a few minutes. Look, friend, you just don't worry too much, or it might start early. Katie took her hand. What happened? Why is everyone running around me? It's still early. I'm feeling fine. Just my blood pressure is spiking a bit. Selena looked at the doctors who were here. Albert. Kathy fell silent. She just couldn't say it out loud. What's wrong with him? My heart thumped in my chest. He'd been hit by a car. Carlo had gotten the call an hour ago. Her friend muttered in a trembling voice. Where is he? How is he feeling? Selena wanted to get up, but at that moment a strong tingle tugged at her lower abdomen. Please don't worry, he's in IQU, alive. But what exactly? Will be known later, muttered Katie. But it was too late. Selena had lost consciousness. She was hooked up to all the instruments that were needed. C-section shouted Katie already as a doctor. The preparations for the operation had begun, and everyone was fussing. Katie realized that her friend would not be able to give birth easily. She lay there, 
waking up and then losing consciousness again. Anesthesia. The command sounded. The anesthesiologist inserted the needle into her back, and Selena, though she was almost unconscious, felt her legs give out. She was laid on the table, an IV in one hand, a machine in the other that took her blood pressure. Katie assisted and the operation began. Selena couldn't see anything. She was as dizzy as before and sometimes foggy. What's wrong with my husband? She whispered with parched lips. It's going to be okay. Kathy was doing her job. That's it. You have two wonderful boys, she told her, but her friend was so exhausted from the whole thing that she didn't understand much. Since the babies were premature, they were immediately placed in special boxes. Selena was taken to the intensive care unit to recover a little. Katie, Selena called out, but no one answered her. A few minutes later, a nurse came over. What did you want? She looked at the girl on the bed, who was pale. Get Katie, where is she? Selena thought she was shouting, but she was actually speaking very softly. She'll be here shortly, check the IV, and the girl left. In the morning, Selena was moved to a regular room. She still couldn't recover from the shock. Hi, honey, Katie came into the room. Where have you been? Selena was already coming to her senses. Don't worry, everything is fine. Carlo is with Albert. She held her friend's hand. What's wrong with him? Tears came out of his eyes. He's in a coma, but the doctors say he's going to be fine. Katie tried to reassure her. How did this happen? And where are my children? Selena turned her head. They weren't in the room. They are in a special room. When you feel better, I'll take you there. Katie spoke quickly. Are they all right? cried the girl. Yes, they'll be fine, her friend assured her, like a doctor. The next day Selena got up, she went straight to them. For a long time, she stood looking at her two sons. Billy and Barry, she said aloud. Are you naming names? Katie came up behind me. Yes, look how tiny they are. The newly mommy drove her finger along the glass. Everything will be fine, don't worry. Her friend took her hand and led her somewhere. Where are we going? Celine worried. To Albert's, don't you want to go? Katie stopped. Do you want him to come to his senses? The wife hoped so. No, but I guess if he hears your voice, he'll feel better, the woman speculated. They got to the floor above and Selena saw her husband. He was covered in plaster and bandages. She came over and took his hand. Congratulations, you've become a daddy, she cried. He can hear everything, Carlo whispered in his ear. He's been here all this time. Sometimes Katie took over, but she had to work and rest. I know, Selena said through tears. She went back to her room, called her mother, told her about everything, and she came to see her the next day. A few weeks passed, Albert came out of the coma, Kathy said that soon the children could be moved to a normal environment. They had grown up and could now do everything like full-grown children. Albert, his wife came to see him. I'm sorry I didn't listen to you then. He couldn't make himself intelligible, but she understood him. It's going to be okay, she kissed him. And so, after a long time, Selena, her mom and two wonderful babies were home. So, we need to get everything ready here. The woman looked at the room the parents had allocated to the children. The crimp had been bought, everything else too. Albert had to do it all while his wife was in the hospital. But as it happened, they had to do everything themselves. Selena was very grateful to her mother and friends for helping everyone. One day, she was sleeping and had a dream, and in it, she and her three children. Then she wondered why there were three because she had given birth to two. In the morning, Selena told her mom, it's just a dream, the woman told her. But Selena began to remember that during the surgery, three times, it felt like her skin was being stretched. The first time, there was a baby. The second time, there was a baby. But after the third time, there was nothing and no one. That's what she told her mother. Daughter, Kathy told me you were out of your mind, the woman smiled. So what? 
I remember all that. Selene squinted her eyes. Probably Kathy would have told you about it, Mother suggested. Katie, her husband, has been diagnosed as infertile, snarked her mother. And what? You think she took the baby from you? I realized what my daughter was thinking. Why not? Selena was being paranoid. So, look, it's all in your head. And where do you think he is now? Mom wanted to reassure her. Hidden away, there was speculation again. Don't talk nonsense. There's so much to do. Albert will be discharged soon, and he needs care. The mother continued with her chores. Hi, how are my puffins doing? Katie's here to visit them. Selena knew Carlo was in the hospital, and if Katie was here too, where was the baby? She shook her head to make the silly thoughts go away. All together they drove this evening, the boys were so pretty. Albert had been released from the hospital, Carlo had brought him home, he was no longer the cheerful man he'd been before the accident, the base of his skull was fractured as well as his hip joint. He had to be taught to walk again. Thank you for not leaving us, Celine hugged her husband. I'm sorry, they put him on the bed. Now it was as if there was a third child in the house. My mother-in-law and my wife took care of all of them as best they could. The boys were growing up. Albert started to get up slowly, and his wife was always by his side. Come on, darling, one more step. He walked around the apartment, he tried. He did not want to fall in the mud in front of her. Of course, he got tired quickly, but he did it with all his might. Selena, bring me the children, he said, and she went straight for the two toddlers, who were already crawling around the apartment. Oh, you're so fast, Dad couldn't handle them. Imagine if it had been three, Selene seated herself at his side. What are you talking about? It's not the first time I've heard it. Get it out of your head and bring up Barry and Billy, he looked at each. You got it all mixed up again, Celine laughed. Okay, I'll remember soon he was still very weak. Selena, I suggest you take Albert to the surgery. He'll feel better immediately afterwards. He'll be able to walk normally, Kathy called her. That's what they did. The wife arranged with a clinic, the price was reasonable, and Albert was taken. When the boys were almost a year and a half old, their father walked around the apartment with a cane. Well, Tom boys, he stood his ground. Dad, they ran to him. Soon the kindergarten line would be coming up. We'd have to call mom again, Selena said. I don't mind. Albert loved his mother-in-law. Selena had to go to work, so she called her mother, who was happy to visit her daughter and son-in-law. It was not a burden for her to take care of her grandchildren. Have you noticed that Carlo and Katie have been coming over less often? Selena asked her husband. Here we go again, calm down already. We would have found out a long time ago if it was as you say. Albert was losing his temper. I don't know, but I'm sure of what I'm saying. Selena stepped away from him. She watched the mother settle the children and grimaced. She dreamed about having three children very often, and after that she woke up in tears but she never told anyone about it again. Everyone just laughed at her. Were you sick again? Albert kissed her. No, it's okay, she replied to his kiss. The boys went to kindergarten. They liked to run and play there. When they were three, their grandmother went to her place. After that, they were taken there on long weekends. I'm going to go to work, Albert told his wife one day. Are you sure you can do it? He's walking now but he's still limping a little. Yeah, he was ready to go into battle. Okay, just please be careful, his wife told him. He left, and she walked him to his car. Selena was working now too, and her sons were big, so she had no trouble getting them in and out of the garden. They dressed on their own, and then spent the whole trip telling their mom all about what they'd been fed and what they'd done. Life took a new turn, at home, the special bed Albert used to sleep on was removed. The creeps were also moved to the closet, and now there was a beautiful bunk bed for the boys. Wondering if there were three of them, where the third would sleep, Celine stood looking at the rearrangement of the room. Stop fantasizing, her husband, who heard her thinking out loud, 
told her. Trust me, it's not a fantasy. A mother always feels. She turned to him. Why don't you talk to Kathy directly? You've been friends for so many years. He told her then. What if it really is my fantasies and the man takes offense? Selena thought to herself. They were less likely to go to the Dutcher with their friends now, either because they didn't have the time or the opportunity. But today, they just wanted to rest, especially since tomorrow was a day off. Katie, hi, Selena called her girlfriend. And good luck to you, she replied with humor. Now I got a call from the railroad station master saying my son was there. She quit as she told me. I don't understand anything, call your mother, shouted Albert. Selena dialed a number, but her cell phone was out of range and no one answered her home phone. Lord, really, come quickly, she hurried her husband. They got into the car and drove to the train station. While Albert was parking and getting out of the car, Selena had already run into the building. She was shown the door, she opened it and froze in place. A few minutes later, her husband came in after her. He too was amazed. Hello, brought them out of their stupor by the policeman. I need to talk to you, Selena told him. She looked at her husband, who was still staring at the boy. Okay, let's go outside, he showed her where to go. You understand, this is my son, but not mine. I mean, I didn't raise him. She began to ramble, not knowing how to explain everything to this man. What are you talking nonsense? You decided to get rid of the child, so have the strength to admit it. He did not believe her. Did you call custody? She asked. Yeah, he saw his partner call the authorities. They'll be here now, and we'll ask him ourselves. Selena breathed out. She was pounding so hard, she couldn't do anything. Hey, Albert came up to the guy. Hello, Alex looked at this unfamiliar uncle, but he wasn't scared. Albert couldn't believe his eyes. In front of him sat a boy, who was a carbon copy of his twins. What's your name? He asked. Alex, the guy answered quickly and simply. Alex, Albert repeated after him. When the guardianship came, they couldn't understand a thing. Selena told them some stories about childbirth and skin tension and everything else. Woman, have you been drinking? The oldest asked her sternly. No, I'm telling you, she puffed up her lungs again. Wait, Albert came over. Look, he pulled a picture of the children out of his wallet. Then they couldn't understand anything. So is this your child or not? They asked again. Yes, I gave birth to him, but I didn't raise him. Celine said for the hundredth time. Nothing is clear, we're taking the boy, when you've made up your mind. Come and see us, she handed her her card. Let's go to Kathy's, Selena commanded her husband. A few minutes later, they were already at her friend's apartment. Selena couldn't calm down, she was still feverish. What's the matter with you? She opened the door for them. How many children have I given birth to? Finally, this question did not come as a shock to either her or her husband. What are you talking about? Her friend didn't understand. Just answer the question. How many children have I given birth to? Name a number. Selena thrust at her. Let's go to the room, she called them. Albert realized that the conversation would not be short. Speak up already, or I won't vouch for myself, Selene glared. Stop yelling already. Yes, you gave birth to three. But how could you know that? Cried Katie. How, you're still asking? Did you sell it to someone? Yelled her friend. Crazy, I would never do that. She got up and went to get water. She took it for herself and hid it somewhere. That's Selena's second theory. What's wrong with you? I'll tell you all about it now. She took a few sips and poured Selena a drink. I don't want to, I'm listening to you. She pushed the glass away. When the labor started, you were very bad. I ordered a C-section, but you remember that yourself. One baby was big, he was fine. The second one was a little smaller, but also normal. But the third one had a triple entanglement. He was almost dead. I didn't even show it to you. Can you imagine what would have happened to you? Your husband had an accident. 
He was in intensive care, and the baby was dead. Katie was crying the whole time. And where did you put it? Throw it away. Selena spoke in a different voice. No, I gave him to the nurse who was there to take him to the doctor unnoticed. She said that the kid was not alive. One lime had not developed, and he would not live till morning. That's what happened. The same nurse came to me and told me the baby was dead. I asked her to bury him. All I did was keep the secret for so many years, I didn't think it would come out, Katie hugged her friend. Forgive me, and I've thought all sorts of nasty things about you over the years, Selena felt guilty. So how did you find out about the baby? Kathy couldn't understand it. Then Selena and Albert told her everything. Jesus, did he survive? Her friend clutched at her heart. It turns out so, Albert quickly walked over and gave her some water. Let's go, the woman got to her feet. She couldn't drive herself, so they got into Albert's car. Kathy told him the address, it was outside of town, and who lives there. Selena looked out the window to where they were going. That same nurse, she's been out of work for three years now. She was old, retired, it didn't go to my head. They drove up to the old house, which was already leaking to one side got out, knocked on the window. There was no answer, as it was dark outside. No light could be seen inside. Who are you here to see? Grandpa came out of the other half. To Grandma Lucy's, Katie said. She's gone, dead since spring, he wiped his eyes. Who did she live with? The woman asked then. With me, you could hear he was having a hard time. How? She pointed to the house. Just like that with us in one half, and her daughter's no-nonsense daughter in the other, he invited everyone to come in. What's your name? Katie asked him. Archie, he led them to the table. Did you and Grandma Lucy have a small child? Katie asked the question cautiously. Alex, was it? He answered promptly. Yes, Alex, jumped up from her seat, Selena. Oh, such a story. He got up and walked over to the stove. Tell me about it, Albert asked him. Betty worked in a maternity hospital. Some woman gave birth there. They gave her a baby, said she wouldn't live till morning. So she came up with an idea to keep her daughter at home, to bring the baby, and told the doctor that he was dead. And the doctor told her to bury him, so she brought him in and he smoked. But he was premature and sickly. Did the doctor really say he wasn't alive? Katie didn't understand. You know what grandfather Ugraf is like. He will raise a dead man from the grave. The old man clenched his fist. I see. Cured ourselves. Katie looked at Selena. Betty brought it to Julia, but she refused. It wasn't mine. And that's all. They told everyone then that the daughter had fattened it. She was such a girl. She could stay away from home for months. And we took her for fostering. But we didn't keep her safe. And he cried for real. What's wrong? Albert came up to him. I left the house for the woods, and Klafka took the boy and took him somewhere. The neighbors told me. I saw her later in the evening. Silent as water in her mouth, he was still wiping his tears. Don't worry, we found your Alex. They started to leave the house. So where is he? The old man held out his hands to them. As soon as we're done, we'll be there, the man turned to him. At home, everyone was sitting around the table. Now Carlo joined them. What to think? We have to go to the guardianship and get the boy. Albert was the first to speak. It's not negotiated at all, but according to the documents, he has a mother, the comrade said. But Alex has it written all over his face. We even have a witness, to even, he remembered his grandfather. I think the doctor who did the exam will say everything too. Won't keep quiet, Katie was sure of it. In the morning, Carlo drew up a statement to the court. The others came to the guardianship office. Alex was so happy about the guests, and it didn't matter that they had only known each other for a few hours. Alex, are you coming to live with us? Selena asked him. Where's my mom? He looked her in the eye. I'm your mom and that odd just stole you from me a few years ago. She tried not to cry. I don't know. He stepped away from Selena and walked over to Albert, 
and you're my dad. Yeah, he couldn't sit down, so he just leaned into it. I like you, but what if the real one comes? He still couldn't believe what this auntie said. I am the real me, look, she showed him a portrait of Billy and Barry. Who's that? He was so stunned that the picture fell out of his hands. These are your brothers, and I'm their mom, she hugged him. Claudia was stripped of her parental rights. The doctor and Katie were removed from their positions. Alexander was reinstated on all documents. He was now Selena and Albert's son. Mom, can you bring the boys yourself? Her daughter called her. Of course, and what happened, she began to find out. I'll explain it to you later on the spot, at which point all the courts were just pulling. Grandma entered the apartment with the boys, and all three of them froze in place. Well, who's the crazy one here? She looked at her mother. Daughter, the mother began gulping air with her mouth. Mom quickly gave her some drops. When everyone had calmed down, the boys went to meet their brother and Celine kept telling them what had happened. How could you? You could feel it. The woman lamented. Mother's heart can't be deceived, she hugged her mom. Yes, I thought that such things are only invented in TV shows and movies, but here it is. It happened to us. You could see that my grandmother is still in shock. Let's go, Celine called out to everyone. Where to now? Her mother asked her, someone I'll introduce you to. Selena smiled enigmatically. They arrived in that very village to Archie's grandfather. He was sitting on the stoop smoking. So, meet your grandfather's grandchildren. Selena got out of the car. I think I had one. He got back on his feet. And now three, the woman laughed. And one by one, Barry, Billy, and Alex began to get out of the car. Whoa, what's mine? He stood there confused. All three of them, no turning away now, still she smiled. After they had visited the village, Selena dialed her friend's number. You're not mad at me. Selena asked that question first. What's it got to do with you if it's your fault? I'll meet you at the cottage. She wanted her friendship and this party back. Of course, I thought you were the one holding a grudge against me. That's why you didn't call. Selena thought her friend cried. You what? They both laughed. That same evening everyone was at the gathering. It seemed like everything was the same as before. Only the children were now three instead of two. And where did you put the third one? Her husband reminded her of a question he'd asked her before. On the couch, she looked at everyone confidently now, not like when everyone took her for a fool. It had been decided that the children would not go to school. Alex was far behind and Selena wanted to get him up to speed in a year. Barry and Billy were happy about that too, and Albert realized that he and immediately said the right things. It was too early for the boys to sit at desks. When not two, but three identical boys were brought to the kindergarten, the teacher grabbed her head. Albert and Selena stood aside and watched their children. They were so happy, even though they had been through so much together. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.